Uh, good evening and welcome to Thursday, February 9th, meeting of the uh, Novi Board of Education. Okay, I apologize. That's what popped up on my screen. I'll pay more attention. It is February 16th. Welcome to the um, Novi Board of Education's regular meeting. If you'd all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. All right. It looks like first we have our student board member report, Dr. Matthews. We do. And we have our seventh grade treasurer uh, here this evening, and so we will invite him to give the middle school report. All right. So, good evening to all of you guys. Uh, my name is Kunal Bose, and I am the seventh grade treasurer for Novi Middle School. I'm here to make some announcements for everyone to uh, keep note of. So this Friday, our school mu musical, The Music Man, will be performed at 7.30 at the middle school. We will invite everyone to attend. Tickets are $7, and it will be a fun time for everyone. The play is directed by Mrs. Birkenhart and involves approximately 70 students, including the cast and crew, so be sure to be there. The, D the Detroit Science Fair will be held March 14th, we have approximately 40 projects competing, along with mine. I'm competing also. <laughs> Some are team projects as well. The topics include plants, chemistry, psychology, physics, and engineering. We are looking forward to get some great results from this competition. <coughs> Spring sports sign-up has started at the middle school. We are hoping to have many, many students participate this year. The sports offered are track and field, softball, boys lacrosse, and girls soccer. The art club is in full swing. The students have been working on ceramics. They are making slab construction bowls, containers, and freestanding structures. Other students are working on tiles with designs and glazing. On February 15th, we held our choir activity night. The middle school choir was visit visited by our high school a cappella group, Major Six. The high school group performed our choir students for our choir students and shared their expertise with us. It was a great night of singing. The 8th grade DC trip will, that will take place this November has currently had 270 students registered. Our previous high was 225, so this year we will be taking 8 buses instead of the usual 7. This, there is still time for students to sign up if they want to join us on this once in a lifetime opportunity. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> I'm just wondering. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> On February 15th, our math club will be sending 10 students to the Oakland County Math Competition, which will be held at Oakland University in Rochester. Also, on February 28th, we will be holding the Michigan Math League Competition at our school for 7th and 8th graders. We would like to give a shout out to our Teacher of the Year, Mrs. Nancy Moore. Thank you for doing what you do and doing it so well. We truly appreciate you. All right, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Mr. O'Connor. I have to ask, what is your science project? Uh, it's on human sensitivity. So, like how se how sensitivity depends on each side. So, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, how it affects. Like, so what I did in my experiment is that I put I had several uh, subjects. They put their hand in cold water, and depending on like what hand they're dominant, I wanted to see if it would affect how long their hand would stay in there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Right. So, Thank you. So is the science fair open to the public? Oh, yeah. It's at Cobo Hall. It's going to be three days. Three days at Cobo Hall. Okay. Yeah. So I would encourage people. Are you going to keep conducting the experiment? Yeah. Excellent. Great. Well, thanks for being here. Any other Thank questions? No? All right. Well, thank you again. And we will move on to our awards, recognitions, and presentations. Dr. Matthew. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, tonight, uh, we uh, have the Novi Community School District uh, Teacher of the Year. Uh, the, this program recognizes our teachers who have, have achieved the highest standards of excellence in our district. Teachers are nominated by their peers with recommendations by administration and many times parents and students. Earlier this past week, three of our finest teachers were recognized for their dedication to the students of the Novi Community School District. This evening, we present the principals who will introduce their 2017 Novi Teachers of the Year for board recognition. And we will begin with uh, Ms. Jennifer Mikos. Good 
Good evening, everyone. It is my distinct honor this evening to honor our wonderful Diane Barbushian, fourth grade teacher who has taught in the Novi Community School District for a number of years. She asked me not to repeat how many years. <laughs> so we know she comes with a tremendous amount of experience and drive and dedication um, for what she does each and every day. She has a, a passion and a love for children, students, and just a curiosity that goes beyond measure. Um, she spends her summers uh, traveling the world to bring that back into her classroom, which is really extraordinary and uh, appreciated. She serves on school improvement teams. Um, she does book studies. She's always there to mentor new staff, um, but from always from her heart. Um, she's really there to, to lead and learn and, and model for other students, um, for other staff, and um, even the staff's kids. She really gets to know the families that she works with. So she is um, just genuine to the core and is um, top-notch, lives into that excellence that we believe in each and every day that all of these teachers live into um, and administrators. And we have a, a student, Conrad Cook, who actually is in her classroom, and he'd like to say a few words, words with you. <coughs> Um, Ms. Lucian is a really great person. She um, she is actually my favorite teacher um, I have had in my five years of Parkview, and she's just a really great person. <laughs> so in recognition of outstanding contributions to the academic achievement and personal growth of students, Diane Barbushin, we give you 2017 Outstanding Elementary School Teacher of the Year Award. Thank you. Now we, what, oh. I think Mr. Cook would also like to say um, something. Ms. Garbushian, I apologize. Um, I had to run out the other day. I was talking to you two minutes before everything took place, but I still had to run out and I missed the, the festivities. Um, you've done a wonderful job this year. I know it hasn't been easy. <laughs> Somebody has put you to the task. <laughs> but. Um, it, it's well deserving and I, I understand your feeling that nobody's better than the others there because everybody there is is pulling forward and it is a, truly a community no I community school system parents teachers everybody's involved in it but congratulations for rising to the top And I would now introduce Ms. Stephanie Schreiner, who will introduce our middle school teacher of the year. Good evening. It is a pleasure and honor to be here. <laughs> I, Ms. Nancy Moore has been a teacher for 27 years, 21 of them at Novi Middle School, and I've had the honor of working with her for the past five. Um, there's a lot of words that I could use to describe Ms. Nancy Marsh. She is dedicated. She is particular. She is careful. She is, has a high, very high ability to look at details and see and plan and organize in a way that benefits the group. Um, four years ago, we took on the Connected Math Project at, uh, in the 6th, 7th, and 8th program, and I credit a lot of the work in the details of the success of CMP with Miss Nancy Moore. She sat with her department, and not to say that the rest of the group did not work and contribute in each of their own way, but Nancy took each lesson under her scrutiny to make sure it was right for our kids. I can repeat that as this past year we've worked to develop lessons for our Obeas Bullying Prevention Program. And, and you see nodding heads from seventh grade students present. Those lessons come as a part of a prepackaged deal. But you know they're not written for us. 
And when our committee gathered last year, a certain someone <laughs> volunteered to take a look at those lessons and structure them in a way that fit our students, our clientele, taking the details from each one, not only planning for our academic 20, but most recently structuring lessons in the content areas that also attended to the content. Our science department presented their lessons, their Novi Power lesson today, relating that to the strength of the hidden figures, stars in science. Taking that time, attention to detail for our kids. Those are just two ways that I can honestly say that Ms. Moore deserves to be the Novi Middle School Teacher of the Year. such a great staff at the middle school. Um, I had started my teaching career in high school and when I decided to come back after my boys were older, um, I, I substitute taught for about six months, in, including at Novi Middle School, actually the old building, um, and just knew that you know that was the place for me. It was the age, such special age for students and um, just a wonderful staff then, and although it's changed over a lot in those 21 years, it's still a great staff with great administrators um, that support you and um, great teachers that um, just embrace the you know the ideas. This this bullying program, for example, and I bullying program, <laughs> for example, you know people just aren't just uh, just doing it. They're they're putting. They're embracing it. They're putting their, their heart and soul into it because they know that it can make a better climate for our students. So I, I'm, I'm really honored to have taught for these years and the school district and um, especially at the middle school. Thank you. Oh, my husband Barry. <laughs> my husband Barry is here, is here tonight. A, a big support. Always. Stand up. Would anyone like to make a comment? Mrs. Uh, my daughter had the privilege and opportunity of having Mrs. Moore as her math teacher in middle school just a couple years ago. And uh, <laughs> she just does an awesome job. Our family has also been privileged because my son is uh, one of Nancy's son's ages. So I remember the day she told me she was going back to the classroom. And that's hard for me to believe it was 21 years ago when you told us that. But um, our district has been blessed by an enthusiastic, passionate, caring, caring about each individual student and what's best for them. And I'm just really proud of you and congratulations. And now I would introduce uh, Miss Nicole Carter for our high school teacher of the year. Good evening, Dr. Matthews and Board of Education members. It's another great day to be a Novi Wildcat. On behalf of the staff and students of Novi High School, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you our 2017 Teacher of the Year, Mrs. Jody Sakaitis. If you could join me, Jody. <laughs> Jody has taught for 23 years where she's worked in a mildly cognitively impaired classroom. She works with students who have a wide range of academic and functional needs. She engages in lesson design that is inclusive of the individual needs of her students. She matches their current ability and challenges them to progress towards reaching their goals. For example, Jody had a student who could not sign onto a computer. She designed a template to cover the keyboard with specific holes for needed keys. With this template, the student was able to experience success and learn how to type her name independently. This is one of many examples of how Jody uses her knowledge and skills to enhance student learning and growth at Novi High School. Jody goes the distance for our students. Jody is a master at developing schedules, plans, and routines for students and staff to follow so her students can be as independent as possible. 
She is truly gifted in her ability to be proactive and positive in her daily interactions. She constantly gives of herself to ensure the needs of all students gets met. She is impeccable with the relationships that she has developed with parents through constant communication via email, phone calls, and daily logs. She's even taken it a step further by empowering her students to create a weekly newsletter that includes events and activities that are happening in the classroom, in our school, in our district, and our community at large. Jody goes the distance for our students. Jody is an admired leader within our high school family. Many of our staff members visit room 123 to get a glimpse of the magic that goes on due to the best practices that she demonstrates daily. She genuinely cares about her students having access to activities both inside and outside of school. For instance, when a ninth grader approached her four years ago describing his interest in football, she found a way for him to participate on the team as the hydration manager. As a senior, Jody supported a wish for the same student to run a very special touchdown play. This simple gesture has left an indelible mark on his life, his family, the entire Novi community, and abroad. Just last week, she supported another student in getting an opportunity to participate in a varsity ski meet. Jody goes the distance for our students. In one of the recommendation letters that we received from a parent, Jody is described as, she sets an example to be followed. She's a veteran teacher with high energy. She pursues her work with professionalism, dedication, and sincerity. Most of all, she makes a difference above and beyond expectations in the lives of her students. In a student recommendation letter, Mrs. Sakaitis made me feel like I could do anything I wanted if I set my mind to it. When I see her in the hallways or anywhere else, I will stop and say hi. Mrs. Sakaitis is nice, caring, and the most happiest teacher to work in the entire school. She cares when someone has had a bad day or if someone is being picked on, she will help try to solve it. Jody realizes the tremendous responsibility that she has in being a teacher. She takes pride in her approach and the passion she has is truly contagious. She loves what she does, and anyone who has the privilege of observing her in action can not only see it, but you can feel it. It is evident that Mrs. Jody Sakaitis goes the distance for our high school students, and that is why she is deserving of this recognition to be named the Novi High School 2017 Teacher of the Year. from one of her, her colleagues, our constant area leader uh, for our special education department, Ms. Megan Taylor. Uh, so there's three words that I would use to describe Jody. Yes. Uh, <laughs> humorous, humble, and remarkable. Humorous, uh, so in, in interviewing students for the nomination process, there was something that all of them did while I was talking about Jody, and as soon as I mentioned her name, they all smiled. And so I was curious, I said, so what's this big grin on your face? And they said, she is the funniest teacher. <laughs> the funniest teacher. And so I can attest to that, because many times in department meetings or high sensitive topics, Jody has brought a story that is, leaves us all rolling during the department meeting. So that's, that's great fun for us. Um, she's very humble. Every conversation, every meeting, every presentation, every event that I've ever been to, Jody always gives credit to the students, to the paraprofessionals, to the other teachers who are involved. She never takes that to herself. So Jody is a role model in education, um, and then remarkable. From the moment that Jody wakes up in the morning to the moment that she goes to sleep at night, and I'm pretty sure all the moments in between, she is orchestrating learning in her mind, um, and the very next day, she goes into the classroom and she listens for the cadence of the students. And she is just has become uh, one of the most amazing conductors of education that I've ever worked with and seen in action. So um, I love the days when people who are 
think of themselves as ordinary are recognized and reminded that they are quite extraordinary. <laughs> You do have a family here as well. <laughs> <laughs> my husband, Keith, my daughter, Erin, and my other daughter, Kylie. <laughs> I'm not sure we can it, make a comment after that. It's quite, quite, um, quite great um, presentations by all of our administrators, and um, really appreciate you guys all being here, and certainly. Um, your families too because we know that behind your families <coughs> excuse me behind you are your families and coming to work every day for 21 uh, m m we don't know how many years Mrs. Scarpucci has been here, but, but, but as many years as you've come we know that your family you've made sacrifices to do that um, from your family so we do really appreciate that and thank you all for being here and supporting them um, in the ways that you can support them from home so we appreciate that as well all right well, we will move on to our comments from the audience related to agenda items. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to make a comment about something that's on our agenda this evening, now is the time that you would come forward, filling out a green card, and Mr. Mena will um, be keeping track of the time because we allow about five minutes for comments. Anyone like to speak this evening? Okay. <laughs> well, seeing none, we will move on to reports to the board. We have our district science program. Uh, if, uh, Ms. Murphy, I might suggest that we take just a moment to see if anybody wants to leave before we, uh, we continue. They don't have to. They certainly can stay for the science report. Uh, but but uh, it, we have some uh, awesome refreshments, refreshments yes, for the <laughs> teachers of the year. So. Yeah, well, we will, we will take a five-minute break right now. We'll re reconvene at 7.30 um, so that people can uh, pay their respects and students can get back to studying. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, well, welcome back to the um, February 16th um, Board of Education meeting. We are to the point in our agenda that we have reports to the board. We have the District Science Program, Dr. Matthews. Thank you very much, Ms. Murphy. I'm very excited this evening uh, for the board to hear about our uh, science program as it continues to evolve and, and uh, take shape. And I will turn this over to Dr. Weber, who will introduce our presenters for the evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Matthews. Appreciate that. Good evening, board and community. Hope everyone is well. This is a, a particular evening that brings me uh, an immense amount of pleasure because uh, in uh, living, breathing, real time, really here, uh, to my right sits four people that are um, a pivotal part of why our district has the success that it does. And they won't tell you this, but I'll tell you. Uh, number one in the county for the second year in our science scores in the county, 30 districts, K through 12. Seven years ago, we made a decision rather than going with coordinators to empower our teachers and start a content area leader model where teachers lead our curriculum development and enactment. Tonight, the community gets to see four of the very finest people that we have in those roles, and it brings me a tremendous amount of pride uh, to look over there and see them. Since we've enacted our publicly searchable Atlas Rubicon database for K-12, we've had 16,051 visits to this day in the past two years on our parent portal alone. On November 10th, 2015, the Michigan State Board of Education adopted the Michigan Science Standards. Well before that, our content area leaders and teachers were working to make sure we provided the best science opportunities for our kids. Tonight, what you're going to see is a little bit of a look back, but much more of a look forward. I'd like to introduce, and if all four of you could please go to the podium uh, just for this moment, and then I know you have an order for the presentation. I'd like to introduce first off Bridget Zaradnik, uh, who teaches at Parkview Elementary School. I'd like to introduce Jeannie Dial, who's over across the way. Uh, Brian Langley and Emily Polanski, both at the high school. So uh, with that said, thank you so much to the four of you for this presentation. I know you're going to represent your colleagues really well. Terribly exciting to share, share with the board and the community uh, where we're going next. And I love the fact that we don't stop. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you, Dr. Weber. Of course, <laughs> Mr. Marjane. Please. And uh, thank you. Hi to the board. I haven't seen everybody in a while, but it's good to be here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm really excited to share this plan with you. This is literally years in the making, and um, we have parts of our district that are starting this. They're, they're in progress right now, and parts of our district that are going to be over the next few years, and we're excited to share our transition. We have a PowerPoint. Is the PowerPoint right behind. visible? Okay. And so I am Brian Langley. I teach physics at the high school, and I am one of the science cals, as Dr. Weber was talking about. Uh, I'm part of a team, and we are covered at all different parts of our district. I'm really excited about it. As Dr. Weber was talking about, we uh, we are science leaders here at Novi, and there's lots of ways that you can look at um, our science successes, both curricularly and extracurricularly. But I think that one way that is the most public is in our statewide test scores. And so our first slide here shows fourth grade, seventh grade, and eleventh grade, um, our levels of proficiency and, and advanced proficiency. And the green uh, in those graphs is NOVI. And we lead the state. Well, we are leaders in the state. And we are leaders in Oakland County. And a few years ago, when we heard about this transition to, or that we were going to be adopting new standards, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a plan in place so that we could stay leaders. And actually, I think the content area leaders and I believe that we can come through, through this transition even stronger. So I'm excited uh, to have my colleagues here walk you through part of our history of how we got to where we are right now and our plan for how we intend to be a leader going forward. So as RJ said, last fall, in the fall of 2015, the state adopted the new Michigan Science Standards. And you may wonder what could really be so different about these science standards, but they actually 
represent a significant shift in the vision of what science education looks like. We call it three-dimensional science learning, and it's because instead of teaching science as like isolated concepts or factoids that kids have to learn, they will be woven in, they'll be learned through doing science. So there's science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts, and they're all taught together. They a lot of times shown as a braid. They are woven together, not independently from each other. One of the other major shifts that we talk about will be all standards for all students. At the high school, for example, where I teach, the um, students right now all have to take biology. But then they have a choice, two of the three, earth science, um, chemistry, or physics. But then they're all tested on all of those concepts. And that's a little tricky, and that had to do with the way the standards were set up before. But these new standards require that all students learn life science, physical science, and earth science. And later on, Brian's going to talk to you about our plan for the high school to help make that happen. Now, with this shift, like, um, like RJ said, we've been working on this and planning a long time ago. And we have been very deliberate about the way we're rolling this out. Bridget carefully looked at the elementary curriculum, identified which topics are being taught now, because at every grade level in this new shift, every content is changing. So every teacher will change what they're teaching particularly in the K-6 in terms of topics. And so Bridget thoughtfully noticed, um, okay, in this grade, this is being taught, and phased it in. So my daughter, who is a third grader at Village Oaks Elementary, is not going to get photosynthesis three times and never learn about physical science. So you'll notice things like fifth and sixth grade are already starting this year. Then, um, and they're the leaders in our little race that's going on there. Um, following them next year will be 7 through 12, so the middle school and the high school, and kindergarten and third grade. The year after that, then you'll see first, second, and fourth grade. And that was a very intentional and staggering to make sure that every child has a fluid K-12 experience, all getting that life, physical, and earth science experience. So, this is just reflected here as well, and you'll notice this is a phased rollout, which provides time for planning and professional development prior to the year of implementation, time to get our atlas up to date, and time to get our assessment blueprints rolled out. And you'll notice we have been so busy already getting people ready, because next year's the biggest chunk of teachers. And so this is our professional development calendar just for, the, uh, for just this year and it's impacting teachers K through 12. I, I can't wait for you to hear about what um, Bridget was doing just last week with our kindergarten and third grade teachers where they were working with actual students, practicing, teaching these new kinds of lessons. Um, but this is, again, we did NGSX training at the high school, not just for our building, <coughs> but also for um, teachers from all over the state. Okay, Emily, do you want to explain what NGSX is? <coughs> oh, yes, absolutely. So. Um, these are the Michigan science standards, but the, they were based on the next generation of science standards. So a lot of the curriculum materials you'll see or the um, trainings will have NGSS, but NGSX, the X stands for exemplars. So teachers are, they spent five days, five full days exploring exemplary science teaching that's three-dimensional around this new way of teaching science. Mr. O'Connor? What was the rationale between breaking out K-3 and then uh, launching first, second, and fourth together? That's a great, okay, so um, <coughs> K and K, not K through three, K and three. Yeah. So imagine my daughter, right? She has already been moving along on the GLICs, right? The current Michigan science standards and has had certain topics through those years. And we wanted to make <coughs> sure she some of those, all of those topics in the new science standards have moved around to different grade levels. So we wanted to make sure we thought about not just what we needed to get this rolled up, but also what the individual child would experience as they went through us with this shift. Does that make sense? All right. <coughs> so I'm going to let Bridget go ahead and talk about K4. <coughs> Thank you. So I want to just give you a history of um, the types of things that we have been doing and the intentional and deliberate types of decisions that we've made 
in our journey. So in 2015, I was able to visit um, the National Teacher Science Association convention <laughs> that was held in Chicago that year. And as part of that, one of the things I was able to do was visit with all of the companies that sell science curricular materials. And I was able to put my hands on their materials, ask them a number of questions, um, ask them really tough questions, see if they could answer the types of things I was looking for, look at their online materials, and kind of got a sense of some of these companies and what they had to offer. Um, after um, being able to do that, we settled on working with uh, certain ones we felt would uh, hold up, and we wanted to pilot them. So we had, last year, multiple pilots going on at the same time, and with the pilots, uh, also provided professional development for the teachers that were doing the pilots, so that they would have an excellent understanding of these new science standards and the three-dimensional learning, so that as they were working with the materials, they could assess for themselves if these materials were truly aligned with the, the next you know, the next generation science standards would, in conjunction with the Michigan science standards. So at the end of last school year, we came together, and the, all the teachers that had done the pilots, and we held up each program against something called the EQUIP rubric. The EQUIP rubric is something that was designed to help educators assess for quality, and the Q is for quality instructional um, programs. And so this rubric helps to determine whether the materials really truly are aligned or not. And it's, it's a quite tedious process to go through this rubric. Um, so we um, did put all of the pilots that we did and came out with uh, FOSS um, as the, the shining star of, of the materials. And um, with that, we have decided that FOSS is an excellent choice for us for a number of reasons. First and foremost, because of the alignment with this, the standards and the three-dimensional learning that we're seeking. Um, but also because it is a kit-based um, program, much like our elementary teachers are used to using. They're used to using a kit-based program now where all of your materials are stored in these giant tubs, but they're all there for you to uh, pull the materials out of. As an elementary teacher, elementary teachers teach, we teach everything, right? <laughs> All in the same day. So um, science instruction oftentimes requires a lot of preparation, a lot of materials, and a lot of forethought. So what we want to do is make science instruction as accessible as possible for all elementary teachers, and we felt the FOSS kits would help us do that. Additionally, you see up there it says FOSS plus ECA Management. ECA Management is a company that helps to manage materials. And so what they do is they prepare the kits and they deliver them to us and they're already ready. So for example, if I need 25 pieces of wax paper cut in a 2 by 4 I normally would be doing that in anticipation, in anticipation of my lesson. However, ECA will have already done that for me and packaged it. Uh, ECA delivers the kits prior to when you will teach them, and that will be in accordance with our Atlas um, timeline that is established. And then they come at the end and they pick the kit up, they take it back to their facility so that elementary teachers do not have to store these kits, because as you can imagine, um, storage at the elementary is, is an issue sometimes, and these kits are very large and they take a lot of space. What it also does is the ECA um, management company also replenishes the kits so that if I use the, um, you know, the wax paper and it gets all wrinkly, the next time I get it next year it will be nice and fresh wax paper. <laughs> so um, those are two of the things that we felt would be really beneficial in helping our elementary teachers teach science with intention, but also to make it accessible for science, for elementary teachers to teach science um, you know, on a daily basis. And Bridget worked with science teachers from across the district, so went into every single building, previewed these kits, listened to them, worked with them. The ECA component, then uh, Mr. Barr, Ms. Polanski, 
uh, visited the ECA uh, headquarters actually. And so our goal really, we talked about this before the meeting, is we want to take away every single barrier from our teachers to enact this curriculum. As Bridget said, being an elementary teacher, you are, you are going in you know, math, social studies, science, ELA, everything else. So when these kits come, they are, as, as Bridget said, all put together and ready to go, replenished and there. Taking every barrier we can down to make sure science instruction is happening in the K-4. And I know you did a tremendous amount of work in going out and, uh, and really having some good hard conversations with the vendors as well, so thank you. And one additional piece I wanted to mention is that the uh, professional development that we are, um, Emily mentioned that we have a schedule for the professional development to be incorporated in the years prior to our teachers rolling out. So next year we're looking for kindergarten and third grade to roll out. So just this past week, last week, um, both kindergarten and third grade teachers were able to attend a professional development session where they learned about this three-dimensional learning they had an opportunity to use FOSS, their FOSS kit materials, and we brought in students. We brought in kindergarten students, and they did. They had like 10 minutes to look at the lesson, and they did science with these kindergarten students and the materials that they would use, and then we did the same for third graders. And then at the end of that, I asked them, so what did you think? And they said, we can do this, and this was great. The, the materials were easily laid out. I was able to follow the lesson, even with 10 minutes preparation. The kids were amazing. The conversations that they were having, they were very fired up because we're teachers, we like working with kids. So um, by bringing the kids in, it really helped to, uh, the teachers get a really solid foundation for what science instruction will look like um, for them next year. And then we will repeat this process for first, second, and fourth. Uh, when they roll out um, in the following year. Yes? How many kits do you go through in a year? Like, is, so, is each kit just one day? That seems like mm -hmm. it's, it must be a theme or a... Right, so most currently, um, most grade levels have three or four science units. Okay. So a kit is a unit. unit. Um, with the Michigan Science Standards, we will all have three units. So we will have a physical, an earth, and a life science, which also is going to help us um, with something that we've always wanted to do is that, that depth over breadth. So we're going to be having less units, but we're going to be able to go deeper okay. into each of those units and really uh, spend the time to teach science in the manner according to these three dimensions. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is this yeah. for all learners? Because I'm thinking of some students that are low achievers, like how will they adapt to this new curriculum? So yes, science is all standards for all students. And the, you know, the way that teachers um, have to teach any subject matter is through differentiation. Mm -hmm. So with the science materials, we're you know, the, the materials are just the means to, you know, the delivery comes from the art of teaching. So teachers will deliver science instruction for all learners, but they will differentiate the instruction just as we differentiate our math curriculum as well for a variety of, of learners, as well as we differentiate our reading curriculum and so forth. So what the materials will help us do is be very well prepared and not have to spend our time on preparing materials, but preparing differentiation strategies for all students to be successful in science. Thank you. Any other questions on the um, elementary portion? Okay, so I'm gonna then turn it over to uh, Jeannie Dow, who will talk about the fifth sixth grade. I'm excited because we got to go this year. We got to get started with uh, full implementation. And uh, of course, before we got there, we had a lot of preparation. I just wanted to touch uh, on one of the things that we did, this book here, uh, Science Notebooks, Inquiry, uh, Writing About Inquiry, is a book study that all fifth and sixth grade science teachers participated in last year. And this was a, a very uh, integral, integral part of our preparation for the new science standards because science notebooks are really important for acting as scientists, writing as scientists, collecting data, talking about data, 
um, talking about science experiences, writing about science experiences, presenting about science experiences. So that the notebook is really a heart of the FOSS um, uh, curricular materials and the experience in science. And that was a great preparation for us. We also had, of course, training in the, in the three-dimensional learning. And our teachers were fired up and ready to go. And, and it's happening this year. Uh, before this happened as well, we also piloted a couple of units. In addition to the ones that happened at the K-4 levels, we also looked into the University of California Berkeley's program called Seeds of Science, Roots of Reading. We found it to be very good, but we also found that the FOSS materials were um, far superior when it came to the accessibility for uh, students and for teachers. So we began this year, and uh, we again have three topics that we are uh, doing in fifth and sixth grade, or oh, actually for fifth. And uh, this <clears throat> has changed this year already. I'm seeing the changes with the teachers and with the students. Every day, students are being scientists, doing science, talking about real experiences in, uh, <clears throat> in the, the science world. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, we <clears throat> also have integrated, together with our work in science, we have integrated some of our uh, writing uh, needs in the district. We have. Um, school improvement plan in, in fifth and sixth grade to be writing in every subject area. And this ties very well to that. Students are learning how to write claims and evidence and reasoning about all of their experiences each day in science. And uh, it's, it's really been a rich experience. Uh, we also, let's see, uh, that's it, that's it. Okay. I am a high school science teacher, but today I'm also going to speak to what's going on in our seventh and eighth grade middle school building because um, our middle school cal, Laura Garrick, is coaching this evening. But I'm really excited to share what's been going on over there as well. Um, we have been looking carefully for also for curricular materials for our seventh and eighth grade group. And um, we discovered that there's a lot of materials out there, at the, particularly at the middle school level, that claimed to be aligned to the new science standards that weren't actually aligned at all. They had stuck those labels on them. And so we, we carefully looked at it using, again, an equip rubric. And um, we reached out to some of our colleagues from the Michigan Science Teachers Association. A lot of people are struggling with the same piece. Like, what do we do about middle school? Where's the best stuff for middle school? And um, after some close look at um, several companies, and we discovered iQuest and CPOP that were rising to the top with, um, alongside course law. One of the interesting things that just happened is that um, the group of us are on the Open School Science Council, and we're helping um, do this kind of leadership for the county as well. And so to, today, um, a group of teachers from around the county got together to analyze middle school science materials. And guess what? From all over the county, leaders and um, science leaders from all over the county all came to the same conclusion that we did. Rising to the top, CPUP, FOSS. So at the middle school level, we had a group of teachers who tried CPUP out this fall at the seventh grade. And they were so excited. Their kids had so much fun. And what you'll find about CPUP, and we've left some materials here for you to look at, is that it doesn't look like a traditional science textbook. In fact, each unit has its own little book. And when you open it up, each unit is a problem. It's a puzzle that the kids are starting to figure out. And these are real issues that people actually face. And each lesson is a new clue to help figure out the problem. And as they make it through the unit, at the end, they're going to end, they're going to engage in written and verbal argumentation around this particular issue. Alongside these, these books are also materials. Now, they won't look like the kits that they have for FOSS, they are, because our middle school science teachers are, for the most part, dedicated science teachers who are there all day. So their kits will live in their classroom, but they're really more like trays. And we have a cart here for you to look at if you'd like to. And, um, but basically, a teacher will be able to slide out a tray that has to do with that unit, has all kinds of material ready for them. And the teachers, at the end of each year, will just simply assess what they need in order to refill those trays. But um, you'll see that each day the kids are engaged in doing scientific investigations to figure out the things that they need to do to learn this science content. And that's the big shift that you'll see, and this stands out in the middle school. The middle school also has had professional learning 
I mentioned the NGSX training that we hosted here at Novi. Our middle school teachers were engaged in that. They've also been heavily engaged in understand by design training, where they think about how should a unit look where a kid, where we begin with the end in mind. And so again, these CPUB units were developed with using the UBD framework. And I went to just double check this last summer, I spent a week in Colorado, and I met with um, one of the writers for the next generation of science standards that our Michigan science standards were based on. And he is not connected to any of these companies. And I said, at middle school, who's your closest one? Who's your best bet? He says, CPOP. And so, and then I met with teachers who were actually using with CPOP for the past year. And they all said, this is great. We have everything we need. We're ready to go. So we're, we're excited. We feel like that on all different levels, this CPOP is rising to the top and it's the one to go with. Um, I mentioned, and again, 7th and 8th grade begins their rollout next year. At the high school level, um, we have been looking for materials. I, I am a high school teacher, high school biology teacher. And we've been looking for curricular materials, and um, we've been engaging in pilots over many years with, through the University of Pittsburgh, through Michigan State University. Some of the universities have been building units for high school. And so we've been piloting those in our classrooms and trying them out. And um, we also engaged in NGSX training at the high school. And that was, again, five days of looking at exemplary units and how to develop units that are three-dimensional in nature. And then I'm going to have Brian step in and talk about that. Sure. So I So I'm Brian Langley, I teach physics at the high school here. Uh, standing back there listening to what we have going on, I told you we keep hearing this word ex exciting and we're excited and excitement. Uh, I'm proud too, I'm proud of this work that we've put together. And uh, having everybody presented tonight just uh, reinforces that in me. But I'm excited too, so count me in. And, <laughs> and we've had challenges at every level of this transition. And one of the big challenges at the high school level was dealing with this all standards for all students. And it's a challenge that, that I'm all in on. I think, that's, I think it's a great idea. And, but what, what is this going to mean for our classes? Because they're going to look different. I teach physics, and physics has been, has been growing. When I started, this is my 17th year in the district, and I started off teaching chemistry, but I've been teaching physics for 12, somewhere between 12 and 15 years probably. And when I started off here in the district, there were two physics teachers. We now have four physics teachers, and we are we're grooming our fifth one right now. So, uh, in the future here, every student in Ohio will be taking physics. So we, we had some decisions to make because the the state doesn't lay out the standards in terms of classes. They they lay out the standards in terms of these big ideas of, of physical science, earth science, and life science. And so we had to decide what that was going to look like for our classes. So what we decided was to go with the traditional three classes, biology, chemistry, and physics. But what we would do is we would take the chemistry and physics classes especially, and we would, we would weave in earth science where it fit. And speaking from the physics standpoint, I think we have two remarkable classes that we're going to be offering starting next year. The physics class, I'll talk about that one because it's the one that I've been working closest on. But not only is it going to include the physical science that we've been teaching in physics, and it won't be, it won't be all of the physical science. It won't be the same physics class you see right now, which is really math-based. There will be less of the calculations and more of the um, applied sciences to things like the universe. And what our class in physics will look like, it'll start with the universe and it'll work its way down. Universe to stars in our solar system, to planet Earth. Uh, I think it's going to be just an outstanding class. And chemistry will have some top upper science topics that they weave in as well. Biology, they're going to look different too, and their differences are going to be mainly because of the three-dimensional uh, changes that we've been talking about through this whole piece. But that's what we've been working on at the high school. We don't have, um, although we've been working on pilots and looking at pilots and some different pieces to our curriculum, we've been building these classes. And so actually today, I was with the physics team and the chemistry team was right next to us, and we were working on putting together what is this going to look like next year and what our classes are going to be. 
And so, back to Adam. Can I ask a question first? Oh. Um, how is this going to impact the other rigorous courses that we offer, like our AP, biology class, and all those? Sure. So, you know, I, I'm going to answer that. I'm going to say one other thing. Um, I mentioned earlier about us being leaders and uh, leaders at the state level, leaders in our county. Um, our, our rollout plan, we're, we've been a leader in this too. And when we go to the Oakland County uh, Council meetings, the Science Council meetings, these other districts look to us. And the word is out that we've been very deliberate about our plan. And so these other districts are, are asking us, what is your plan? What does your classes look like? What are they, we're going to be presenting at the Michigan Science Teachers Association Conference, which is going to be a no-buy this year, coming up next month. And we're going to be doing, uh, Emily, I, and Seth Furlow are going to be laying out what this plan looks like at the high school. But to answer your question, a, um, a few years ago, we decided in the science department to let go of some of the prerequisites that traditionally uh, schools have for their higher level classes. So for example, it used to be that before you took AP physics, you should take regular physics. Um, we have students who are ready to be challenged immediately, <coughs> and we have removed those kind of prerequisites. And so I, don't th I, I think that this just becomes, these just become great options just like the rest of our options. And students will have the ability to take this physics class or this chemistry class or this biology class, or if they're ready, go right into IB physics or the IB biology or the AP physics or environmental, so, or the biology. Um, I teach IB physics, and I am thrilled with this, this, this um, physics class that we're building with the, with the um, bringing in the earth science, weaving through the earth science. That's, that's very similar to what my IB physics class looks like. Now, my IB physics class will be at a little different level, but uh, very engaging, I think. And what, uh, it's, a, it's a nice little segue in this part, what Brian and Bridget and Emily and Jeannie are too humble to say is that in the state, uh, this is quickly becoming known as the Novi Way. People say how they're calling our rollout, our research, and everything that. Uh, Emily has been invited to again present at the Governor's Summit on Education. Um, I look at these four folks and, and realize that their leadership, Jeannie leading a book study amongst her entire building, is not, this is not common stuff. I think if you're a board member in Novi or a longtime teacher in Novi or a parent in Novi, we can sometimes get into this habit of believing that, that what you're seeing here is normal, that this is happening everywhere. It's not. And the reason it's not is because we have people like this who absolutely are committed to the craft and the kids of this community. And, and the outcome of that is when we see the success that we do for our kids, when the science department steps up and says, no, we don't believe in prereqs. If you can do it, you can do it. We're not going to put an artificial wall or boundary there. And have we had a, a wave of failure? No, we haven't. Actually, we've had an increase in classes in AP and IB and other classes. And, uh, and you guys won't say it, I will. Uh, stunning. The work that you do is stunning. They got a call today from a district that is funded about four grand more than we are per kid, wanting to know how are we doing it? How are we doing it? And I love it. I think Edison's quote that uh, success or opportunity is dressed up in overalls and hard work, right? It's nothing magic. It's not a program you buy or a pill you take. It's sitting there and doing the work. And for the past six to seven years, our teachers have done the work. And it's amazing. So, all right, I'm off my soapbox. So, I'm wearing my Michigan sign. So, are we charging no. that district four thousand dollars a kid to share our ideas with them? I'll let you work out the business arrangement on that, Dennis. But I think uh, I'll tell you what. Well, and I love that you asked the question also about how um, how do we preserve choice? Because one of the things in this district that we have prided ourselves in is that we have options, electives too, like um, genetics and forensics and med careers that kids come here and it helps make us a destination district. And that was when we made this decision about which schedule we're we going to pick, because there's a couple different options, we had two criteria. Number one, all standards for all students, but number two, we're going to preserve choice. So in addition to keeping the prereqs out of the way, we also tell kids that they can take these classes in whatever order they want. So if a kid wants to take biology and chemistry at the same time their freshman year, which we already have a huge chunk of kids do, 
that's fine. If a kid wants to wait to take biology until their reading and writing skills are stronger, but they're great at math, they can start with chemistry. So it lets kids kind of build a schedule that makes sense for them. And we have, with this, um, we still, there's still only three required credits for science, and they're just going to be slightly different looking classes. Um, one of the things you may also wonder about is accountability. What are these state assessments going to look like? Uh, we were wondering that same things ourselves, so uh, Brian and I volunteered last summer to help write these tests. So um, <laughs> the, uh, these, um, I was skeptical, honestly, when I went in, and really excited about <laughs> what came out of it. Um, they had, how do you build a three-dimensional assessment? How do you do that? Well, what they, they, all of these assessment items are actually tech-enhanced. And so kids are dragging, dropping, counting, doing these things, and then answering questions. And so um, take a look at this timeline here. You'll see our intentional rollout timeline is matched up with the state's timeline for their assessments. So by the time we're done with our race, our kids will all be ready to go. Spring of 2020, that's the new science test that will every that, that we'll see in 5, 8, and 11. That is this tech-enhanced three-dimensional assessment that will actually start to count according to what the state has put forth with their ESSA plan. Um, you'll see this year they'll have the science M step that is based on the current science or the older science standards that our kids have been getting all along. Next year, they'll begin to see some Michigan Science Standard test pilot items popping up. The following year, it'll be a full field test, but the year of full testing implementation will be spring of 2020 in our kids. <coughs> to close, we just want to make sure you understand, as much as the state has asked us to do this, they said, you know, these are our new science standards, we really do believe in this new vision for science. And I'm a little selfish. I got a kindergartner here, and I've got a third grader at Villa Jokes, and I'm loving it. But I, I always think about them and what kind of science experience that I want for my kids. And if you think about maybe the stereotype of science where kids are doing an experiment, but they're maybe given a set of like prescribed steps that they follow, that's kind of like what a cook does. Somebody tells them what to do, and they plot it out. But I want my daughters to be chefs. I want them to be the ones that design the recipes. I want them to design their own investigations and discover things. And that's what I think this new three-dimensional science will do for our kids K-12. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we have five <coughs> questions before, uh, oh, or yeah, no. something. Oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> Mr. Mena? No question, just just comment. I, and, uh, I'm going to kind of share this. I, I get into these intellectual debates with Dr. Matthews regarding the number of highly effective teachers that we have in this district. We do have a lot of highly effective uh, teachers in this district, but clearly you guys are a step above, okay? And that's why I always say, you know, we, we really need to have an uber highly effective <laughs> for some of these folks because, and, and, and I say that seriously because what you guys are doing here is setting a blueprint, clearly not just for our district, not, for, not only for some other curriculum that we may have within the district, but for, for children really across the state and in, in other area districts. Um, and I, um, you know, we, we debated uh, years ago um, as a, a board whether or not we needed to hire a, a marketing communication person for this district, and we finally did it. And my, at least my vision for that was for us to answer why no high schools. I always thought that everything that we do here should answer the question, why no by schools? And I, 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 I kind of wish I can just box you guys. I, I almost wish like we can take the video um, of, of this meeting right now. We should package this together. This should be on our website. And, and, and we should be um, telling folks out there, you know, that, that we are we're so much advanced in this area. And this is actually, as you said, a destination district. So I thank you for what you do. I, I'm actually, I almost wanted to get up and, and, and give you a standing ovation because I was absolutely impressed by this. Um, you know, I, I, I saw this. It, we get a lot of these type of presentations, okay? Um, and um, this was much, much more than what I was expecting. Absolutely impressed. Absolutely impressed with what you guys do. Um, I, I just got to figure out a way to, uh, you know, partner with our administration here to figure out a way to, to use this to, to just make sure people in, out there understand how we uh, set our district apart from others. So thank you again for what you do. Mrs. Klusinski? Well said. I won't repeat that. I have a simple question. 
because I get a little test anxious. So in uh, spring of 18 and spring of 19, when we're MSS piloting and field testing, does that mean the science scores, you know, our little stoplight, you know, are we good, are we whatever, do those count? Or are some people taking the old M-step and a few people are trying the new ones? I mean, because as you ease through and we transition, what's a fair assessment for our students and what's a fair representation of the success of our district? This is a great question. And so we were working with TJ Smolik at the Michigan Department of Education this summer. And in, in their ESSA plan that they submitted for the state, they said we would like them to not count for the okay. next two years. So that is that is their. Is it request. adopted or it's well, just it's, like it's, it? We still aren't. They still haven't heard back, but they have. They submitted that plan last June, so okay. they haven't gotten a pushback on that. And so we had a follow up meeting at our science council with TJ. We called her and said, "Can we just double check? Has anything changed?" And this this came directly from her timeline, and she is the one building the assessments for the state. Okay. We will, of course, have our own assessments in district because right. we need to know right. how things are going. And yeah. that's, again, if you look at our rollout, you'll see we some of our materials, FOSS comes with some, um, CEPA comes with some nice assessments already built in, already aligned. But um, we've been actually at the high school working. Um, turns out a Moodle program that we already own can build the same kind of three-dimensional tech-enhanced items that we can build. So we've been playing around with the biology teachers. How do we build some of maybe an end-of-course assessment that looks like the one that they're going to see? Okay, so we don't think all tests should look like this. Um, there's a reason it looks this way. It needs to be graded quickly by the state. But we think that our kids should have some experiences like this so that they're not caught off guard right. when they get mm -hmm. there in their junior year when they take this test. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. Other questions from the board? If I could also say to Mr. Mena's comment, the, uh, Dr. Matthews and um, Steve Barr and Carol Diglio were eminently supportive of our move to a content area leader model. And the issue is that what you see here tonight is happening throughout our district, really. Um, when we hired our communications director, I, I said to him, our district is really like a, this big, beautiful, honey crisp apple tree that's just full of the most perfect apples. And it, it, the issue is, where do you start, where do you go to find out, and every one of them you pick. But as Brian said, uh, he was working with his physics teacher team today. Right next to him was a group of chemistry teachers working together to improve their curriculum. Uh, Fifteen steps away were our, uh, a group of kindergarten, first, and second grade teachers who were meeting content area leaders to align their curriculum to make sure that we were meeting the needs of our kids. And uh, you don't have to walk far to find inspiration, and it's in the form of folks like these and our kids. If you look at the pictures they chose on the presentation, uh, you'll see kids obviously at the center of all of those. Of those. And in the middle there, uh, we had a visit from some folks from Bosch, and, uh, and our kids are there suturing and showing them how to suture. And, and they walked away. These are, these are folks who work for a $78 billion a year company thinking, wait, these are, these are high school kids doing this? said, so absolutely, come by any time you want. I can take you into many rooms where you'll see not only that happening, but I can take you down to Parkview Elementary so you can see kids 3D printing and coding in first grade and second grade and so on. I can take you into Miss Dial's room and show you what she does with their kids, actually articulating what they know about science and how they've been explaining it in that way and building things and making things. We have so much to share, and I agree, we need to find a way to get it out there. There is, there is truly so much of it. And they would be hollow words if we didn't have the metrics to back it up. You saw the graphs that Brian showed you from the beginning. Not only are we saying these things, we can prove them on paper again and again. And Dr. Matthews, I know, has shared with you our rankings in the county and in the state. Uh, Bridge Magazine, I think they just came out with their state champs. Our high school is in the top of that group. I think the Mackinac Center actually gave our high school one of their top ratings. It just keeps coming, right? So uh, again, thank you so much for the board and your support of this model and of these teachers. Last week, we had a, a budget discussion. Here's, here's the part, right? And uh, to implement our K-12 program is really going to be the financial commitment out of our Office of Academics for the next three years. Mr. Barr has worked with everyone there and beyond to make sure that that could happen and would happen. And, uh, and it, it takes all of us to do this, and I just, I'm, I'm so proud to, to work with all of you, so thank you. Great presentation. Yeah.
Excellent presentation. Very well thought out. But easy to understand, too, for some of us who aren't real sciencey. So I appreciate that very much. And, and I'm excited to come and observe um, in the classrooms as the kids are working on some of those things. I think that'd be a great opportunity for the board to be able to kind of see hands on what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here as well. All right, well, we will move on to our consent um, agenda this evening. We have um, two items. We have the approval of the minutes and approval of field trips. I'd like to entertain a motion. Mrs. Klebzinski? I move uh, to approve the uh, consent items A and B as presented. Is there support? Support. It's been moved by Mrs. Klebzinski and supported by Mrs. Stevenson. Are there anybody have questions or comments about our consent agenda items this evening? Seeing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries 7-0. All right, next we have um, action items. We have a personnel report, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Ms. Murphy, and I will turn to Ms. Diglio. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. This evening I have uh, three recommendations. I have uh, two psychologists, uh, Caitlin Elliott, who will be placed at Nova Woods, um, and uh, Ashley Weinhardt, who um, is a new hire, and she'll be working in a um, school, probably traveling between a couple schools. She's going to be serving as a psychologist, but also um, supporting uh, TCs in, in that capacity as well. Um, I also, and I think you're going to want to vote on that one first before I go on to B. Is that correct? You could vote on the on the whole. Uh, we just separated them out A and B because B is uh, not a hire; it's a sabbatical. Right. I think that would make more sense. Is that comfortable? The board comfortable doing A separately from B? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing heads nod. So we'll, sure. we'll take A first. Um, can I in, have a motion for? Um, did she? Do oh, did you do the, the leave of absence? The oh, I'm sorry. Person? Yeah. Uh, uh, Seema Amin is a teacher at Novi Woods that is uh, asking for a second year for a leave of absence for child care. Uh, per their contract, uh, they are allowed to ask for one and then they are allowed to ask for one additional. So she is currently on a leave of absence for child care. She is asking for a second year of uh, leave of absence for child, child care. And the recommendation is? That, we would, that the board would approve that leave of absence. Can I have a motion, Mr. Mena? Yeah, motion to approve personnel recommendation A as presented. Is there support? Support. It's been moved by Mrs. Mena, excuse me, Mr. Mena, and supported by Mrs. Stevenson. Are there questions, Mr. O'Connor? You said TC. What is TC? So teacher consultant is um, okay. a position that works in the special ed department, and uh, this psychologist is going to be serving in both capacities. With the, with the consultant, thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Second item, Dr. Matthews? And uh, second item is uh, sabbatical leave of absence, uh, which is a contractual item uh, for the Novi Education Association, and we supplied you with information earlier this week. Uh, I will uh, turn to Ms. Diglio as well. Thank you. Um, this evening, we are um, asking for Angelina Krieger to have a sabbatical leave of absence of one year. Um, in the contract, uh, we do allow for sabbaticals. They are unpaid sabbaticals, um, and they fall under the leave of absence now. Uh, Ms. Krieger is in the audience with us if you have any questions. She's currently an instructional coach, and she has a tremendous opportunity to um, go into some research and uh, learn and bring back information to our district. Okay, I'll entertain a motion first. Motion to approve item B on the personnel agenda, or personnel <coughs> recommendation. I support. Okay, it's been moved by Mrs. Klipsinski and supported by Mrs. Hood. Do you have uh, comments or questions, Mrs. Klipsinski? Yeah, thank you very much for the information that you provided. Um, the big history project sounds amazing. I don't really have questions about it because uh, I don't really understand <laughs> other than it sounds like a great ground level opportunity for you to be involved and also to bring some tremendous ideas back to the district. So I, I want to say thank you for your willingness to, you know, step out and, and broaden your experience and knowledge base and I know we're going to benefit for it. So thank you for giving us the information ahead of time. You're welcome. 
asking if you'd like to share with us exactly. I'm sure there are people out there who are probably wondering uh, exactly what you're going to be doing. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing you mention it to us right now. Yeah, no, that's fine. If you want to talk a little bit more about it and uh, how, okay. how it came to be, maybe. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for having me this evening. So the Big History Project actually is run out of the BGC3 offices in, in Seattle, Washington, Kirkland, actually. And so the Big History Project started about seven years ago. It was kind of the vision of Bill Gates in collaboration with David Christian, who is an Australian professor, who actually kind of coined the term Big History and came up with the course himself as he was a as he was teaching in his history classrooms in his university. And so what he realized as a history professor was that you can't just start history at a date. You have to start history kind of at the beginning of everything, which is, you know, the Big Bang in the universe. And so the course kind of evolved from his vision of how kind of history is taught in that way. So the course goes from the Big Bang to the creation of stars and elements to the creation of Earth and the solar system. And then we get to life and then human impacts in life and collective learning and so on in our modern revolution, and kind of the world that we're living in today and how the, the story of history unfolds. And so the Big History Project um, kind of works out of BGC3. It's, it's out of that office and it's a group of educators that have developed this online learning course. It's free for all students. And about five years ago, I was fortunate enough with the support of our district to be one of their pilot teachers. And so we offered Big History here and still do as a senior level elective. Um, seniors can take it as, as one of their fun social studies courses throughout their, their time here in uh, Novi. And it's rich in reading and writing. And so uh, through that work and my time with Big History Project, I was fortunate enough to be named one of their teacher leaders. And so I would go to Seattle once a year, and I would serve as a content expert and liaison, helping to hone the course and, and answer any questions and serve as a kind of a resident expert, if you will, for new teachers that were signing on internationally and within the United States. And so through that work, um, they have asked me to now you know, a, kind of assume this fellowship role where I will travel throughout the United States about 10 days a month looking at innovative social studies teaching practices and how they align with kind of the coursework of big history and this next wave of social studies education, which is really enriching social studies and reading and writing and thinking like a, a historian model, really actually doing the work of a social scientist. And so I'll look at how PLCs operate <coughs> on an online capacity and an online framework, look at how these innovative uh, teaching practices are happening throughout the country, and I'll be able to bring all of that knowledge back to Novi so that I can support our district and really kind of cherry pick what's going on um, you know, internationally and, and within our country specifically and say these are kind of the social studies practices that we should be looking to and, and kind of use that in a classroom capacity to, to work with students. I think this is a good example to go back to um, a question earlier about what does this do about choice? And sometimes we just have to take the opportunity. Angelina is a rock star. It was one class. We said we'll put it on the, we'll put it on one class, one semester. We'll advertise it. We'll see if it fills. And the kids loved it, and it filled. But now look at the opportunity that it's brought to one of our teachers who's done tremendous work in the district, that now she's going to be able to go across the country and be, bring back to the district. So sometimes you have to take chances on, on uh, classes and uh, ideas and listen to our staff who are passionate and are willing to go out there. Does it sometimes um, give too much choice? Kids will take what is interesting to them, they'll take what they connect to, and that's how we figure these things out. That's why you look at trending over three years and see what's populating. This has been a great class. It's been led by uh, Rod Fant Franchi, I believe, brought it to, to our attention, and Angelina was willing to uh, go for it and look at, she's got an opportunity to really do some tremendous work for herself and the district. And to Mr. Mena's point, another great example. <clears throat> this is uh, Exhibit H, if you will. We had Exhibits A, B, and C in our Teacher of the Year. We had Exhibits D, E, F, and G uh, for our science piece. And here we have another teacher that's been out there as an instructional coach, but Angelina taught, um, taught our English language learners at the high school and was one of the very first teachers to step up and volunteer to teach courses as our numbers grew there. 
Uh, she then took on this awesome responsibility of teaching a whole new course in big history and has flourished so much that she was named a teacher leader. As an instructional coach, she leads with uh, Principal Schreiner and Assistant Principal Cohn some amazing curricular efforts at the middle school around understanding by design and backward design. So as I see you up at the podium, sure, I'm happy. <laughs> but this means you're gonna be gone for a year, makes me unhappy, but that's all right. Uh, just it's, you're another example of, of what makes this district and this community absolutely stupendous. Okay. Mrs. Hood? Oh, I was gonna say, um, my son was one of those young men who chose the big history uh, class and when he came home and told me about it, I didn't quite get it. And then as the <laughs> semester went through um, and we had multiple evenings where he had his group of four high school boys over tearing apart my kitchen um, and then the, to go to the presentation uh, and the kids got it. I mean, from the start, they just got it and it was really, uh, it, it's one of his favorite classes at, at, at school and um, I called him when I had the agenda, I called him just to kind of re-up my recollection and he said, oh, it was fabulous. So, well, thank um, you. and congratulations on being chosen to to, to take part in this nationally. This is really incredible. Mr. O'Connor? Yeah, I, I had time to get very skeptical about sabbatical requests mm -hmm. because I know they come to us here and there, but sometimes I get a little nervous just from in terms of setting a precedent, in terms of, you know, the leave of absence, et cetera. But, but this, this is a winner. This is, this is really good and it's going to be applicable and, and I trust you're going to be bringing back that wealth of knowledge in terms of what you learn, which will be beneficial for the district. So and I'm worried about it. Yeah. I'm worried about it. And Mr. Cook? Um, you picked a good night to, to bring this forward because, um, uh, like Mr. O'Connor has stated, you tend to be a little skeptical when people request sabbaticals. Um, with the group that preceded you um, and the presentation that they gave with the research they did, uh, I kind of look forward to, uh, as our, our is written, you, you will be providing us a written update on a mm -hmm. quarterly basis um, at the end of, at, at once per semester. I, I kind of look forward to that and uh, what you're learning out there and what you can bring back. Uh, procedurally, I'm just kind of questioning, are we going to see that as a presentation to the board? Are we going to see that Friday update? How are we going to see this? Uh, um, we will back? work with uh, Ms. Krieger to, to figure out the best way to present that. Eventually, it would come to the board in a presentation, uh, much like the science team did tonight. Uh, it, uh, during the sabbatical, it may come in Friday updates to the board, uh, uh, depending on her schedule. And so we'll, we'll work that out, but we'll make sure we keep the board informed. Mm -hmm. Appreciate yeah. that. You're on the hook. <laughs> That's fine by me. Awesome. I'll just say that I too am sad that you're going to be gone because I, I, some of my kids have had you and just really enjoyed you as a teacher tremendously. Um, I know that you're coaching now. I'm sure you're doing a great job with that as well um, with the other teachers. So I will be excited to see what, what happens as a result of you coming back. Can I just ask how many currently, there's one big history class? How many are there? Yeah, it's one. It's I'm one sorry. per semester. One, it's okay. one. Yes, because it's, it's, it's a one. It's a one-semester. Correct. Class. It's a semester elective for okay. seniors, mostly. Oh, mostly seniors. Oh, mm -hmm. excellent. And okay. it fills, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. yes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've had a motion in support, so we will call the motion. <coughs> All those in favor of the sabbatical, um, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries seven zero. Thank you for this great opportunity. I look forward to serving Novi out into the larger community and kind of representing this wonderful district. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, next we come to board information and discussion. Our first item is a roofing bid package number four, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, and I will quickly turn to Mr. Barr. <laughs> <laughs> well, now to continue the excitement of the night. <laughs> This is the most exciting part of the night, I think, or letter I, RJ, whatever you want to say. Um, and have roofs to teach. <laughs> um, on January 26th, we opened bids for bid package number four for roofing. This is part of the um, bond projects that were put together several years ago. These projects include actually the third phase of our re-roofing at Novi High School and uh, finishing up the roofing at Parkview Elementary, plus some repairs as needed at Novi Middle School. Um, Chris Kogan from Structure Tech, our roofing consultant, to the podium. They sent bids out. We received um, 
six very good bids, six very good companies, and including your packet is the uh, bid tabulation along with the recommended vendor. At the high school, which um, many of you are very familiar with, um, the, the two primary areas that we're going to be finishing for the roofing this year will be over the field house and over the pool. We, um, as you know, we're going to be air conditioning the field house this summer, first time ever. So we'll be doing that in conjunction with the roofing project when the field house is closed for several weeks in the summer. And the pool will be closed for several weeks and we're already coordinating that through community ed and athletics. So we're very excited. This will be the last phase of um, roofing at the high school and the last phase at Parkview. Chris, anything um, you'd like to mention on this bid? Um, very the same uh, system we've done in the past, uh, single fly <coughs> PDM. Um, and then also, I don't know if you want to talk about the middle school at all, doing a little bit of repair work over sure, there. Sure, Yeah, we're, uh, we did some <coughs> investigation work and uh, um, we're going to do a little bit of uh, scale on repairs, trying to stop some of the leakage that's occurring at the middle school. So you may know that our, our middle school <laughs> roof is actually metal. It's a, it's a different roof, and there's periodically, you know, a little leak here, a little leak there, not like anything's gushing in, but we think we need to do some minor repairs, and we've gotten a report on that, and, um, you know, in lieu of replacing a roof that's only 16 years old or so, we're going to look at doing repairs on an ongoing basis starting this year. How do you find a leak in a metal roof that big? It could be coming in from anywhere, couldn't it? Yeah, it, it, we do what we call leak testing. So we'll try to like itemize the area and then um, is isolate and spray with a, essentially like a spray equipment following AMA standards. Um, so far we've found a leak through the masonry, not the metal, but we found a leak at the metal transition to the masonry. So those are some areas we're going to try to seal up, see if we can get it to um, be less active. This is not a next generation roof at the uh, no. Middle School. Obviously not. All right. Are we concerned at all that um, that we'll be finding more leaks? Yeah, this is not expanded at all in the last five six years. We're talking okay. very minor. Okay. We're not talking anything significant at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, we're pretty perfect in Novi, as you've seen earlier. So we, we try to really get it. We don't want to see one buck anywhere in the hallways, anything, you know, hallway or in your office. Yeah. Yeah. The the. Uh, Air handling unit, the new one we're putting in the field house. My assumption is that, that that'll be in place and ready before the new school year. That work is um, going to be done by July, and done before um, so they're ready for sports in August. Super. Yeah. Actually, they're starting some of that work, Mr. Madison, like a different bit of project, doing some of that work during spring break to prepare up in the um, attic area, and then they'll be doing real work, so to speak, in um, right after school. Okay. That's all coordinated already. Other questions? Or? This will come back to us at our next, next meeting. regular meeting. Yep. All right. Perfect. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Okay. The next item we have on our agenda is our grievance hearing. Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, on December 5th, 2016, uh, Patricia Cortland filed a grievance alleging that the district was using non-union non-union employees to do union work. The allegation was that this was a violation of the Novi Educational Support Personnel Association or NESPA agreement with the district. Relief was sought in the grievance for Mrs. Cortland and Mrs. Amy Hepp, NESPA member who worked alongside Ms. Cortland at Village Oaks. On February 6, 2017, I received from Ms. Hepp an email that stated she wished to be removed from the grievance that was filed by Ms. Cortland. The grievance that now continues includes only Ms. Cortland as a grievance. The grievance process for NESPA has been provided for the Board of Education. This grievance uh, started at level one. Level one grievances deal with issues at the building level. It was determined that this, that this was not a level one grievance, so it was moved to a level two grievance. Level two grievances are grievances that have not been resolved at level one and are appealed, or grievances that deal with issues outside the building. This grievance was determined to be a level two because it dealt with issues outside of the building. The level two grievance meeting was held on December 13th. The grievance was denied and paperwork was given to Mrs. Cortland on December 23rd, 2016. Mrs. Cortland then appealed the denial, making it a level three grievance. A level three grievance is a grievance that is appealed to the superintendent or his designee. The designee would have been human resources, but Mrs. Ms. Diglio had already heard and responded to the appeal. Thus, the appeal to the superintendent on January. Uh, thus, the appeal went to the superintendent on January 6, 2017. 
A meeting was not requested, so the superintendent reviewed the paperwork that had been created related to this grievance. On January 19th, an email was sent to Mrs. Cortland denying the grievance. Mrs. Cortland, on February 2nd, 2017, appealed to the Board of Education. This becomes a level four grievance. The level four grievance process outlined in the NESPA agreement states that the next regularly scheduled board meeting, at least 14 days after the delivery of the appeal, the Board of Education shall hear the grievance. A grievance of a union contract cannot be conducted in a closed session. So tonight, Mrs. Cortland is here to present her grievance. After her grievance is heard, the administrative rationale for denying the grievance will be presented by Ms. Diglio. The board then may ask questions of either party. The NESPA contract states that within 21 days after the hearing, the Board of Education shall communicate its decision in writing. <coughs> the board must make the decision on whether to approve or deny the grievance. The issue must be decided in open session because this is not a closed session topic allowed under the Open Meetings Act. The board may make the decision this evening or may address this issue at the March 2, 2017 Board of Education meeting. The decision must be rendered and sent to Ms. Cortland in writing no later than March 9, 2017. So that's the background of the grievance and tonight, Ms. Murphy, um, I would encourage uh, the board to start uh, by hearing from Mrs. Cortland on her grievance. Thank you for being here. Would you like to come to the party, Mr. Okay. Okay. Before we start this process, just clarification. Are, are we going to deliberate and make a decision tonight, or are we going to ask, ask for information and then make a decision on March 2nd? I would be comfortable with the board's will on that, um, Mr. O'Connor. If the board would be more comfortable um, asking the questions and then coming back and deliberating on March 2nd, I think that we can do that. So I'd be comfortable with okay. that. Our, so well, I was just asking which way we're going. I, Okay. So we can use that, That's fine with me. Okay. Okay. Thank you for being here. Go ahead, Mrs. Cortland. Good evening. For those of you who don't know, I am Patricia Cortland. I have been employed by the Novice School Di Community School District since 1989 and have been an A level secretary in the district since 1997. I am appealing the denial of my grievance that the district used non union employees to do NESPA work in November of 2016. The district moved to centralized enrollment on November 1st with all registrations to be done at the ECEC. Mr. Church Stee chose to use his non-union community ed facilitators to help with this process. I have documented the eight instances when I can prove that the non-union employees worked on registrations for new Village Oak students. This was previously done by the NESPA secretaries in our building. At a meeting held on December 13th, Mr. Stee admitted that Mrs. Diglio had reminded him not to use the non-union employees since I had warned her that I would grieve this matter if the district gave away the nest work. He said in the interest of good community service, he had no other choice. I was also informed that the administration had had a meeting with NESPA representatives and agreed to post those non-union jobs as NESPA jobs. They also did not allow non-union employees to publicly help once my grievance was filed. They could have resolved this issue by posting and hiring for these positions prior to the November 1st change to centralized registration. This course of action effectively proves my case. Mrs. Stiglio denied this grievance and you have a copy of her correspondence. Dr. Matthews upheld that denial I hope the Board of Education will uphold the contract it signed with the NESPA employees. If protecting the work of the employees is not a collectively bargained right held by NESPA employees, then what rights do we actually have under this contract? I am asking for one hour of pay for each infraction. I believe that all registration secretaries in the Novice School District were harmed and should also receive relief, but I am only grieving on my own behalf. After 20 years in this position, my hourly wage is $20.06, and I'm requesting eight hours of compensation for a total of $160.48 for this violation. Thank you for reading my previous grievance correspondence and carefully considering this appeal. I would be happy to share any documentation you did not receive from the administration. I would turn uh, to Ms. Diglio uh, for the administration response. Thank you very much. Um, anytime there's a grievance, it is our intention and our efforts to work collaboratively with our employees and 
um, try to resolve it at the lowest level. Um, and that's usually at, at level one. In this case, um, as Dr. Matthews, uh, this was filed with the building level administrator who had nothing to do with the grievance, so it came my way. Um, we had a meeting on after that grievance on December 5th that was filed with Miss, um, uh, I'm sorry, Village Oaks principal, uh, Miss Burnham. We looked at that, we sat down as a team on uh, December 13th um, with Miss Cortland. Present at that meeting was Sandy Brazel, the NESPA president, Kim Edwards, the MEA executive director, and Bob Steve, the director of community education, and myself. Uh, Ms. Cortland stated the reason for filing, um, and it was because she was stating non-union community employees helped with centralized enrollment. Um, that's true. She also um, stated Article 1 as the reason behind that. Um, some contracts do have language under an article that's called jurisdiction, which outlines employees who may perform duties under specific contracts. Language can be found in both the transportation and um, the maintenance contracts, Article 24 and 31, but it, not such language is in the NESPA language. Mr. Steed did agree that community education non-union employees did help with centralized enrollment because he was not willing to compromise customer service or District 4. Um, it was his job and the job of the community education um, group to make sure that the implementation of centralized enrollment was successful and seamless as possible. Ms. Cortland's position at Village Oaks Elementary um, was not harmed in any way. In fact, we were working to collaboratively as a district to make sure that what she needed to continue the enrollment of new students was taken um, place and um, the customer's needs were met at that time. The district's intention, intentional decision to implement centralized enrollment has been in discussion for many years. But formally, it started um, as a committee of 19 employees, seven in which are NESPA employees. Um, the stakeholders were involved in those meetings. The purpose was to establish the enrollment to provide parents and students with the best customer service experience, again, focusing on goal four, as they enter the Novi Community School District. It was a way to mainstream the required paperwork, improve the accuracy of data entered into MyStar, increase consistency in the district practices, and balance the workload for our building level secretaries. There was no violation of the contract, nor were there any current positions eliminated, hired, or harmed at this time. Um, in our office during the summer months, we have a NESPA secretary, Kathy Miller, who was doing centralized, who was doing centralized enrollment during the summer hours. There were non-union members that helped almost on a regular daily basis um, our executive secretaries in this office would assist Ms. Miller if she was absent. Um, Ms. Holly and Ms. Donovan have been assistant, assisting in that area for a long time. And we do everything we can as a team to make sure that we are helping each other so that kids and families come first. And that's what was happening. In a healthy and collaborative work environment, non-union employees help and continue to support un union workers and vice versa in a time of need. Any good organization focused on providing a service relies on a deep commitment to excellence and camaraderie throughout teamwork. This is no different. In this case, colleagues helped colleagues for the good of the organization. Centralized enrollment was launched on November 1st. With any new change or implementation to an organization or process, it's critical to monitor and revise the process if any changes are necessary. One week, which was November 8, 2017, one week after launching, a meeting was called with Mr. Steve, Dr. Weber, Ms. Edwards, Ms. Brazel, and, and myself to discuss the possibility of community education and non-union employees becoming members of the NESPA union. It was agreed that it would be beneficial for, for both the organization and community ed to bring their non-union employees into NESPA. Mm -hmm. Now remember, this building opened. It took on uh, the new preschool. It took on some other um, changes. It's a new environment. The reason why we launched it in November is because we wanted them to get set up and, and settled into the preschool. And it also wasn't the summer months. Summers can be kind of crazy, so this would help implement. And so we, we looked at that. So several steps needed to be taken. Mr. Steen needed to talk to those non-union employees. They've been here for 11 and four years. 
Um, so this was a change in, in, the, in what they were doing. Ms. Brazel also wanted to meet with them to explain what it meant to be part of the union. Um, a new posting was created, jobs were posted, interviews were completed, and the recommendations came on January 12th. All those things were in the works prior to December 5th when the grievance um, was filed. When examining the evidence presented by Ms. Cortland, the non-union employees supported NESPA employees as a temporary solution during a time of transition and implementation. It was not a violation of the contract. As demonstrated above, action for permanent solutions were a motion to increase NESPA support without adding, reducing, or harming current employees or violating the contract. And again, this implementation was not only to help our families, but was also to help the building level secretaries so that we would take in, in um, the work off their plates in order to help get and standardize that paperwork. There's a lot that goes into registering. If I'm a family and I have four kids and I'm between three buildings, our old way was I would have to go to Meadows, register my two kids in Meadows. I would have to go to the middle school, register my middle school kid. I would have to go to the high school. And that is not in the good spirit of customer service. And for many years, we've been trying to figure out how can we do this. And with the new preschool building and community ed and Mr. Steve's willingness to take this on, this is where, this is where things um, developed. Um, in a few instances, that was necessary, and, and we, we do admit that non-union members assisted the NESPA member during transition, and it was always in the spirit of honoring customer service goal number four, always in the spirit of supporting our building level secretaries, which this allowed Ms. Cortland to do her work in a timely manner. We didn't hold it back, and it also continued to require operations of absence in a NESPA employee. Those, the eight hours that Ms. Cortland is asking for, um, I asked uh, Mr. Stee and, and his staff to kind of itemize out how much time it took. So it was about three hours and 45 minutes of work between those eight do days. Um, two of those three hours and 45 minutes were in Ms. Bouchard's absence. That means that she was not in, in the building, she was absent those two days. So two of those hours were her staff helping, no different than if Ms. we had Vichard. a son in there. Ms. Ms. Vichard. Tanya Bouchard. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. she, she's the NASPA Secretary yep, okay. of Community Ed. So two of, uh, two of those hours, 45 minutes was with Ms. Um, with Tanya Bouchard leading that. So really there's about an hour of time um, that work time that the, the girls put in and, and um, help support a, a, a really big, I think, um, systemic change that we implemented uh, through Dr. Weber's office and community ed to make sure that we are doing the very best to help our, our, uh, our district. And I'll ask you to imagine when we, when we look at the, the various jobs that we do in this district and and I feel very fat, passionate about this because I've done every role from subbing to what I do now. And so I, I want to kind of close by saying I am so proud of the work that our union and non-union employees do in this district. I'm so proud to work beside the secretaries that we have every day in this district. Um, I'm proud of the collaboration, the roll up your sleeves, get after it attitude. I'm proud to provide our students and families with the best possible experience. And if we were to paint ourselves in boxes and draw lines between unions and non-unions, and this is my role and not, and, and not her role, and this should have been done by her and not him, we would create an extremely unwelcoming and extremely unproductive atmosphere and one that would unequivocally put kids last. So I ask you to imagine if a principal refused to administer an EpiPen if a nurse wasn't available, or a para refused to cover a classroom if a teacher was tending a student that was ill, or an athletic director refused to sweep, sweep the gym floor and set up chairs for a basketball game if a custodian pulled, was pulled out for a water emergency, if a director of transportation refused to serve as a bus aide when we were shorthanded, when the maintenance director refuses a call at 2.30 in the morning when pipes burst, when a benefit manager refuses to cover the ESB's front desk when I need to have an HR meeting, when a teacher refuses to serve as an acting principal during a principal's medical treatment, and when a hall monitor walks by a class 
room full of kids that does not have a staff member because they're stuck in traffic due to snow, I ask you what our district would look like if we start doing this. We want to honor contracts. We honor contracts. That's my role. I work with unions every day. I have them in my office. I collaborate with them. I've had grievances. My goal is always to make sure these grievances are managed at the lowest level and in collaboration. In this case, we did not violate the contract. In this case, we did what was right for the district. Um, Ms. Cortland did not miss out in, in, in her work. In fact, we supported her work, and that is why the grievance was denied. And I, and I ask that you just think about all those things where we cross over because we do it for the interests of our kids and our families, and um, I don't know that we ever want to paint ourselves in those corners. Board have questions? Right. Mr. Miller? Um, I hope you grant me a little bit of time. I, mean, I, I spent a lot of time reading all, all of these documents and, uh, and did draft uh, a number of questions for, for both of you. So, um, and, and I thank you for that. Um, some of the questions I may ask you sure. might, might, be, might cause you to repeat some of what you said. And there was a lot there to digest, so I, so I apologize uh, ahead of time. Uh, um, if I could interrupt, Mr. Mena, just uh, for clarification. Uh, would you want us to answer these questions tonight or or just allow all the questions to come out and then come back March 2nd with answers? I miss, uh, um, well, I think that if you have the answers to the yeah. question, it's okay. fine to provide them, but if you don't have the answers, you can provide those either okay. in the Friday update or other okay. places that. So, so I have a number of questions for Ms. Cortland and I have a yeah. number of questions for Ms. Diglio. Um, and I'll start with Ms. Cortland, but before I do that, I, I just want to say that I'm a bit conflicted today because I generally see the board um, uh, in these type of issues as, as really part of management, uh, as we have a fiduciary responsibility for, for the district. But uh, on the other hand, um, our involvement here today is contractually required. Um, so I believe that it's our responsibility to act as unbiased arbiters at this point, and I, and I just want to let you know that's how I plan on proceeding um, as we go forward. So if you don't mind, I, I have a few questions for you, Ms. Ms. Cortland. Um, the first one is that uh, you're basically alleging um, that the uh, bargaining unit work was being performed by non-bargaining unit members in violation of the contract. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And Mr. Stee has two uh, union employees. Two other NESPA employees that if he was felt he was in a, an emergency situation, he could have used them and not violated the contract. I also believe he could have brought in uh, temporary help. I believe the recognition clause clearly says he could have brought in temporary, but he chose not to do that. He used employees who were employed by the district but weren't part of the NESPA union. Gotcha. Thank you. And, and is your interpretation of the contract that the work is supposed to be done exclusively by NESPA employees? It, it was our work when it was in the building, so that I believe it is still our work and must be done by NESPA employees. That's correct. Okay. I believe most of the examples Mrs. Diglio cited are emergency situations. This was not an emergency situation. They had time to plan this changeover, and it was clearly discussed at the Centralized Enrollment Committee that this would take time to do enrollments correctly. It would take manpower. Okay, and um, so you documented eight violations, and you're requesting one hour work pay for each violation, correct? Correct. And how did you come up with, with that, those amounts, by the way? Well, it's really arbitrary. Um, I sort of looked at it like a speaking ticket. I just wanted to ding the district for not valuing the secretaries they have, and I do not speak for them, but I think we are all in the same position. We um, take care of the children. We make the staff able to do what they do so well. We uh, ha uh, hold their heads over a bucket when they grow up. We stay with them when no one comes to pick them up. We don't ask for much. We have very little in our contract. I would just like it to be honored. And it seems to me that this is a, a lot of time and stress for $160. I, my assumption is that this really isn't about money, um, that there's a little bit more to this than, uh, than obviously the pay, as you say. Exactly. It's really not about the money. It's valuing your employees. 
Okay, and one last question that I, that I have for you. Um, you. You mentioned that NESPA was harmed um, by the violations that you're alleging. Uh, if so, can you explain how, um, for example, did you suffer any pay loss or something else that we might not know about? Um, I, I suffered no pay loss. Um, I do not see all the benefits of centralized enrollment that Mrs. Diglio refers to, um, but that's not what we're here to discuss. Um, I think uh, you harm the NESPA uh, group emotionally. Why should we bother to try to be our best, to do our best for all of you, um, when you don't feel like we're part of the team? Mr. Stee said it, Mrs. Diglio, in my view, implied it. I'm not a team player, I would just gone ahead with this. I feel like I'm a big team player. I have had at least three of you who are in this room as part of my building. I think I always go above and beyond what I try to do, and I feel disrespected. Okay, well, thank you. Well, just know that, it, at least from, from my point of view, you are very well respected within the strict so I, can, I really hope that you don't feel that way. Um, if, if I can continue with some questions from Ms. Can, can Diglio. Can allow anybody else that has a question for Ms. Cortland before I, she sits down? And okay. I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Were your hours reduced because this job responsibility was taken no. away? You made a comment about, let me look back and see, that um, you were somehow oh shoot, penalized. It was in your comment. Oh, that they gave away NESPA work. Well, so we, the, the, the workload that you have was reduced, but but we didn't reduce hours or penalize you because you have less of this type to work because you still have a full plate, okay. right? Yes, but we, you didn't give it to another NESPA employee to do it. You gave it to someone who wasn't part of the union. So in that sense, you harmed us all. That's how I see that issue. Thank Any, you. Anybody else have a question for Ms. Cortland at this point? Okay. Thank you well, very much, uh, if I may, Ms. Diglio. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you, you were involved in all the contract negotiations with NESPA, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so, you know, we all know that our board doesn't deal with the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Uh, as far as I can determine, I don't believe there is any state law that requires the board uh, to be written into the contract with regards to being involved in the grievance. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, it, no, it's, uh, you're, it is um, written in our contracts in this way. You're correct. Uh, I was in a OSPA meeting today, which are HRs from all over the county, and it's it's quite unusual that the board is written into this grieving process, this grievance process. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's we're following the the contract as it's outlined and respecting. Um, the contract as it is. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned, our, our fiduciary responsibilities to the district, um, so in, in essence, some could say that we're probably not impartial here. Um, most board like ours are made up of folks with no legal background, um, yet we might be asked to interpret contract language. Um, and frankly, we're not really prepared with a rule book on how to deal with these type of issues, what type of questions we're allowed to ask. So given that, um, why does the district and union agree that uh, to have the board included in part of the grievance process? Is that something that you might consider, uh, reconsider the next time you have an agreement with them? I would. Um, this, is, this is my first time, uh, really, that it's ever gone to the board level. I believe it's Dr. Matthews' first time it's gone to a board level. We are typically able to manage grievances at level one most of the time. So um, is it something we would look at? Absolutely. I, I think that's a, a different question, though, yeah. right, as opposed to dealing with this right. particular grievance. Right. Yeah. Definitely a question for another yeah. right. uh, Absolutely. to consider. Um, if, if the board were to rule in favor of the grievance, does that end the process at that point? If you were to rule in, if you were, so right now the, the grievance has been denied. If you were to um, rule against that denial and say we agree with it, then it would end at this level. If you continue to deny it, then it would go to arbitration. So the next step is that it goes to arbitration. Potentially would go it to goes arbitration. To, yeah, it potentially can go to arbitration again. It would be our intention to see if we can work something out. Um, 
So that would, that's level five, that's, that's the next step. Got it. So as I mentioned, um, um, I, as I mentioned our fiduciary responsibility with the district, um, we as a, as a board might decide that we need a legal opinion to interpret the contract. Uh, this would cost the district probably 50 times more than the uh, money that's being requested. And it's always, it's conceivable that on appeal, um, or uh, an arbitrator could rule in favor of the agreement and award even more than what they're asking for. So given that, can you tell us why we shouldn't just rule in favor of the agreement and limit our damages to $162? Because the, the contract hasn't been violated. I, I think it's very telling that there are no other NASPA members in, in, in the grievance or here this evening. Um, on that committee, the, the central office committee, there were seven NASPA members that were um, participating in that, and they were from every level. There was a high school, middle school, element, two elementary um, uh, secretaries. There were administrators from across the district. There was a high school counselor. Uh, there was food service director. There was technology director. This was a very well-rounded committee. Um, and yet we have no other folks that are here to, to grieve it. That should be very telling when you have a large um, NESPA union. Where it, it, we haven't violated the contract. Uh, we're, that's where we are at a difference here and it continues to be denied because it has not been violated. We have um, take corrective actions if, if there was any to be needed and there really wasn't bringing those NESPA, the non-union um, employees into NESPA really just helped the whole community ed process. They're still doing the majority of their job, the same job. They assist in centralized enrollment when needed. And sometimes things get busier than others and that, that is it. So, I mean, we haven't violated the contract. That's why you wouldn't um, just cut your losses. Now, now, you mentioned that uh, you seem to make a point that the fact that there is no union representation here, that it's telling, but we're a right-to-work state now, and it is possible, um, and, and I, I guess I, I should have asked Mrs. Cortland, it is possible that she is no longer a union-paying member of, of NESPA, and if, it's that, if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense that they're not here representing her? Not always. They still have full, even if you're not in a union, you still have full rights to the contract. Okay. Um, so uh, the way I look at this is come, really comes down to two things, whether or not we violated the uh, terms of the contract, and I don't know how we're going to make that determination, uh, and whether or not anyone was harmed. Is that the way you see it as well? Okay, um, and you still feel that NESPA does not have exclusive rights to the work fun, uh, functions in question, correct? It, it, it's not about, ex it's, I'm not saying that we should not honor their roles and their rights or their positions. What I am saying is that there are times in our jobs, and, in, and if you think of all the times that centralized enrollment was going on, that just on these few occasions, that person who for most of the time was absent, we typically would even have a sub do this, um, we had people in-house that were able to help assist families. So we're, the majority of time we, we honor and we need to do our jobs as they are outlined for us and what we're hired for. But there are our occasions where we cross over. That's teamwork. That happens all the time. And the examples I gave you are real life examples. These are things that have happened in my presence as an administrator or as a teacher, a building leader, or as an assistant superintendent. These are just a few. I can tell you all the different times that we help each other out on occasion when it's needed. For a long time, non-union members have been supporting the registration process out of this office from the months of June through August. That it's not an unusual, um, it's not an unusual occurrence. So when you when you take a process and you anytime you implement something new, you have to examine it. I just met with this with the team. Um, a week ago, I brought my uh, secretary, my NESPA secretary, with me to go meet with Ms. Vichard and Mr. Steedis as a pulse check. How is it going? Where are some things that we can support you? We've put in a line of support so that it can be successful. 
that's all despite, that isn't because we have a grievance, that's how you manage an implementation of a change. And so you communicate, you help each other out, you figure out what's working, what's not, and, and that's gonna, it's only been implemented since November, and it's working pretty well. I would say very well. Yep, and really the, the piece behind this as well is not only is it goal for in customer service, but out of my office, I'm responsible for the data compliance specialist or the people accounting person who works with us here. Every penny that comes into the Novi Community School District from pupils runs through that office. Every penny. Back in October, I believe, of 15, when we had this idea of a centralized enrollment, or I think Dr. Matthews would like to go to a welcome center, which I think has a nice ring to it. Uh, the technical behind the scenes stuff that, that most people can't see is what I get to see, which is data coming in from every building in different ways and us having to then go back and to clean that data to make sure names are spelled correctly, addresses are correct, and so on. One of the primary drivers beyond goal four for this whole piece was the idea of making sure that we could have our data as clean as possible because as all of you who sit around that table and have a tremendous fiduciary responsibility, every penny counts for our kids, every penny. So there were really two drivers here. You had the, the customer service driver, it'd be great if you have three kids and you have one place to go, and you also have this idea of how do we take that work out of the buildings to give space, to show respect to our building secretaries that they don't have to have and drop everything when somebody comes in or a family rolls in to do that. Now we have an appointment system for that, but the other part of it was that fiduciary part of making sure that our data is clean as possible. And our one single data compliance person, one person for 6,000, how many kids do you? 6,500 kids is getting data that's coming through her in a way that is good, clean, tight, and ready to roll. So that was the other primary driver of this. We started back well over a year ago. Thank you. You're welcome. If, I just, I just really would just want to finish. Uh, at the uh, just at the January 12th board meeting, the board approved the reclassification of of these uh, two employees, making them part of the Nespa group. Um, these happen to be the the same two employees, I believe, who um, that the grievance claims were causing the violation of the contract. And and during that board meeting, Dr. Matthew stated that the reclassification aligns the work being done with the Nespa contract. Um, so if NESPA doesn't have exclusive right to that fo uh, job function, then why do we need to reclassify those two employees? Couldn't we have just left it status quo? You could have, um, but you know, some of what we uh, talked about as a group was that they, they happen to be the last two over in community ed that have not been brought over to the NESPA group. Um, so sometimes that just helps with the camaraderie um, it also allowed us to um, change their job description a little bit and um, uh, add on the centralized enrollment as an assistant to that and make some additional changes that would have uh, assisted with the overall function of community ed. Um, you know, between the two of them, you have 15 years of experience. And sometimes you don't make changes because they're there isn't discussion about it. And in this case, there, there was a change where that building opened and everyone came together in that office. And so when you start looking at all the different pieces and you look at how, how we can work collaboratively, it just made sense to us. I mean, it just, you know, that, that meeting that happened on, on, on November 8th, it just made sense that, that they were the last two that we'd bring into the fold. Gotcha. And, um, um why, so, so the documentation that you sent us indicated that we started discussions around centralized enrollment back in, in uh, 2015, and I think uh, uh, Ms. Cortland alluded to that uh, you know, a bit ago. Um, I'm just curious why it was that we waited until we went live to reclassify those two employees instead of maybe doing it uh, a few months earlier. I think, uh, I mean, simply put, there was just a lot of moving parts going on. Um, with the opening of the uh, new preschool, all the moving and changing that was going on, and really just being able to settle in and see what it was going to look like and what it was going to feel like. Um, you know, there, there are other NESPA um, folks that were in the office. 
their, their, their roles increased as well. As we increase preschool enrollment, as we increase um, community ad opportunities, uh, the, the sheer visibility of that building is beautiful. You walk in and you want to have that immediate service oriented feel. So, you know, sometimes when you are making decisions, it's not always obvious right in front of you until you start actually implementing and doing it. And so that's why we are in con continuous communication with everyone over there to see how it's going. And, and there's even, um, uh, for the summer months, that's going to be our first time for the summer. So we were thinking, too, down the line. Uh, right now, it's typically a little bit slower. Um, but when that summer month happens, we were looking down that line too. It, it, it made sense for us to bring them into the fold now before summer hit. We also, through that committee, um, the other seven NESPA employees that um, sat on the committee have openly said we would be happy to help during the summertime if that, um, if that gets heavy or increases too much. So we, we are working on a plan to make sure that that um, works well. All right, just a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Um, Mrs. Cortland mentioned that you warned Bob Stee had a community yet against using um, non-union employees. Can you explain that? You know, there are some things that are uh, were Miss um, Cortland's perception of things. Um, it wasn't so much that I warned him; I just reminded him that there was, you know, some concerns that were voiced in those meetings. Miss Cortland was very vocal in those meetings. Uh, that uh, that to, to work at using NESPA as the um, primary person and to try not to use non-union people. It's not that I warned them, I didn't wag my finger at them or warn them. We were trying to implement something pretty big, something that has never been done in the district. And so, um, you know, my, my more conversation was to Mr. C that Ms. Cortland did verbally um, state her concerns. But it does, when things are, and that is trying to respect what she was saying. But in, in the reality of it, and in the absence of our NESPA employee at the time, we needed to keep work moving forward. We weren't willing to shut down the shop and say we're not going to make this happen because we were going to have to use other people who are able to help. Last question, uh, if you don't mind. And, and this, I just, this is just more of a, maybe a softball. I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. Um, our documentation that we received state that uh, Mr. Stee used uh, non-union employees because he was not willing to com compromise customer service and district goal number four. Um, I assume that you and Mr. Stee don't feel that our district goals um, take precedence over union agreements and union contracts, correct? Say that again. Um, the, um, so, so we were told that um, that the reason Mr. Stee used non-union work, at least from his words, was because he was not willing to compromise customer service and district goal number four. So that's what we, we read in our documentation. So do you and Dr. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, do you and Mr. Stee feel that district goals uh, take precedent over union? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, and again, we weren't violating the contract. So, and, and I apologize, a lot of these questions that I had were, were developed before you know, you got yeah. to say. No, that's okay. okay. Well, that's all I have right now. Thank you for your patience. I appreciate that. Okay, Mrs. Klipczynski. Uh, right. I'm glad you got up because uh, my my question is for actually both of you. You cite that Article One recognition was the vi we violated recognition. Can you explain that? And then if you could uh, explain, you you respond about jurisdiction. And I, I'm trying to understand the difference between recognition and jurisdiction. Oh, well, I believe that that is the clause in our contract that gives us any rights. It says who, who falls under NESPA and who doesn't, who specifically doesn't. Two the two secretaries who are named oh, temporary. Okay. Yeah. So I believe everyone else falls under it. And that is the only clause in that contract that this describes who falls under it. So if, if we have any rights, I believe it's because we have a recognition clause. clause. Okay. Thank you. And that recognition, she's correct that when the recognition clause is about who that the nego who is the contract is being negotiated for. Okay. So the NASPA group is including secretaries, 
including paraprofessionals, um, media center, um, paras, and so on. Um, but it doesn't say we cannot have people assist in jobs. We didn't, what we did not do is we did not take this completely out of NESPA's hand and bring someone else. We didn't reduce their hours by three hours across the board and then have non-union workers implement and do the work. We did not harm or reduce. We did not uh, uh, lay anyone off. We didn't take hours or reduce pay. We didn't do any of that. We, in fact, we didn't even add new people. So we simply just implemented a new process. The, the, the NESPA secretary over at Community Ed is still leading it. And at time of need, we had someone else um, support that. And especially that time of need was, in, was when Ms. Bouchard was absent. So if we were harming or, or not recognizing that, we would have reduced their time, their salary, in order to implement something new, and we did not do that. Okay. Could you explain, um, you said that there is a jurisdiction clause in the transportation agreement. Can you explain what that yeah, I have it looks right here. like and that we, yeah. so I understand what we don't have in the other country? So the jurisdiction is basically saying that um, people, for example, like maintenance, that you, um, in this agreement, temporarily Excuse form. me, could you please not paraphrase and please read the verbiage? I was, I just started to read it. You were paraphrasing, it sounded like you were paraphrasing, so I'd like to understand the verbiage that's in there for that. The employees of the employer not covered by terms of this agreement may temporarily for, perform work covered by this agreement only for the purpose of instructional training, um, experimentation in the cases of emergency and or vacation, seasonal work, time sensor work, um, or work not uh, work necessitated because of uh, employee vacation when regular employees are not available. This clause shall not apply to special projects for employees to perform work on a voluntary basis provided by projects or not violations on local, state, or federal building codes. Thank so you. that is the maintenance jurisdiction. We do not have a jurisdiction clause in the NESPA contract. Thank we, you. Okay. Mr. Cook. Who determines um, what work the NESPA employee, what work the NESPA employees do? Um, I'm recalling a couple of years ago when uh, we really started with the background checks and it was done here and then all of a sudden it was disseminated throughout the, the, the buildings and adding work to NESPA employees. So who, who actually determines what the work and workload the NESPA employees have? Well, I think that the individual, um, two things. Uh, one, we're, we're going um, through an exercise with the NESPA union right now looking at roles, but there are uh, a history of job descriptions um, and postings that um, typically show what that individual person does. And as time and workloads ebb and flows, or in times of um, where we have to reduce staff or lay off to determine on our budget, you, you have to reallocate and look at things based on what's going on at the given time. Um, when populations increase, um, when buildings grow, for example, Parkview is a good example of that. There's a head secretary there, um, but Ms. Mikos runs the largest elementary building tipping at almost 600. Um, all the other elementaries have a half-time, one and a half secretary. Ms. Mikos has two full-time secretaries. So sometimes that it's, that's at central office of looking and evaluating what the needs are, and sometimes that's at the local building. Um, when you implement new software because of the way you have to report immunization, when you get a new software, which is my star for attendance and keeping track of grades, when those things are implemented, you have to reevaluate those job responsibilities and determine what needs to be added or subtracted. So it all depends. It can be at the building level, the department level, or it can go high as, as the um, uh, central office. But we work in collaboration with NESPA. So when those changes are occurring or going on, or if we need to change job descriptions, we also work with NESPA. So was there an analysis of the job description taking place prior to the implementation of central registration, central enrollment? Analysis of all the jobs? 
analysis of what the Nespa, what the effect on the on the Nespa employees at the individual buildings. So we have um, we have worked with our Nespa across the board, and, and we have heard that you know when we added the the point five or the the half time secretary, some of them felt like it still wasn't enough. So this was one way of taking a as Dr. Matthews described it a constant interruption when new families are coming in, it should feel very welcoming and we should be able to help them right away. And as families are coming in, and, and as Ms. Cortland described, their days can get very busy. This was something that seemed very universal that could help every building across the board, every secretary at every building across the board. So did we analyze the workload? We, we, we did have a committee, and, and part of the committee's work was to analyze uh, how this would impact the, the building level and how that work would be accomplished at the uh, district level in, a, in a, a centralized enrollment. Absolutely did not happen in a vacuum. It happened in a room again and again with iterations of how this could work, listening to the people who work with so, us. So when you use the word analysis, I'm curious what you mean by the word analysis. Well, do, do we take a, take a look at the, the hours that the individual building employees, Nesman employees were spending doing this work? and Went, went over to, to the ECEC, did we say, yeah, that's only one employee that we already have over there, or did we say, that's, that's more than one employee, it's 1.25 employees, so we have to come up with another way to fill this in. And if we determined that we needed more, why did we wait until after we implemented it in order to um, change the classification of these employees? So what I'm understanding you're asking is, did we do a time study? Basically. So that would require then a time study uh, by the hour of every secretary in the district. I don't believe we did we a time study. We didn't do a time study, um, but we did, uh, we did have um, our part-time secretaries. We increased them uh, from 3.5 to 5.5 two years ago because we heard and could feel that they needed extra support. Um, okay. and, and I believe I answered your, your other question that uh, you know, we didn't make the change or make this decision until November, again, there were a lot of moving parts at that time, especially with the opening of the new building. Okay, can, could you provide us a copy of the posting of the two, for the two employees that we transferred over into NESPA, please? Sure can. Are there additional questions? Other information that the board feels like they need? Prior uh, to we'll get those postings uh, to the board. I would encourage the board if you after tonight, if you uh, think of other additional questions, that you would uh, email both Ms. Diglio and I, and, and uh, we'll be sure to provide that information uh, before the March 2nd meeting. I do have just Go ahead. Okay, I just have one mm -hmm. question, because you described a couple of instances in past practice um, when we're doing enrollment, um, where if people come in here, they used to come in here during the summer, mm -hmm. right? and that if the NESPA person wasn't able to help, that other people would help. Mm -hmm. So it's yes. been a past practice. Has that happened besides in isolation during the summer at um, our elementary schools? So where, the, where high school, the high school will have a counselor there year round. So the high school um, staggers their counseling staff so that they have um, a counselor there that's all summer. Every other building, so then that meant that K through eight would come here, and so we did that registration during those summer months when the buildings were closed down, and we, we couldn't have. We've always had Miss Holly or Miss Donovan support Miss Miller during that time. So Sheila Holly was uh, was my secretary before she uh, jumped ship and went to Dr. Matthews. <laughs> Look back at her. And really, in the month of July, uh, I was amazed at how little she um, could really do out of our office in that sense, because in the month of July, she's invariably up here helping with registrations. And, uh, you know, Sheila's uh, an ace, obviously, so all it would take is if we doubled up on families or anything like that, uh, she had a sixth sense, and she'd just walk up there and take care of people. And that was really her July. And Ms. Murphy, I'm, I'm in buildings quite often during the school year, and I would tell you that in many of our schools that are growing, if we have three or four parents in line to register their children in the past, the last thing a principal is going to do is say, excuse me, you must wait for an ESPA employee to help you. So, they so will, a principal, we're going to provide customer service. The last thing we're going to, we may, we may think about an ESPA, but you know what, we're going to provide a service. Are they going to say, no, you must wait 15 more minutes for an ESPA employee? They're probably going to say, here's a packet, get started. 
So they might take a minute or two and help them. I mean, our goal is to help provide service. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, so this, oh, this, do I need to attend the March 2nd meeting? I guess that's all I need to know. Um, we will be deliberating or making that decision at the March 2nd meeting, um, uh, but you don't necessarily have to attend because we will provide the um, information in writing to you after correct. that meeting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Okay, next we come to our comments from the audience. Um, if you do have a comment from the audience, would you please fill out the green card? You can discuss anything within our jurisdiction at this time. And would you state your name? And you can give your card to Miss Holly, actually, in the back. Would be great. And um, we do limit comments to about five minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. My name is Sherry Warner, and I have um, lived in Novi for 20 years. I have three sons, two of which graduated from Novi, and one who was a fourth grader at Village Oaks. Um, I uh, will never forget my oldest son's uh, 2014 graduation ceremony from Novi High School for many reasons, but one reason I did not foresee. My first grade son, James, was keeping himself um, entertained with my cell phone through the traditional long speeches. When Dr. Matthew's name was announced to speak next, James perked up and he exclaimed, my Dr. Matthews? <laughs> yes, he was in first grade and he was calling the superintendent of 6,300 students, my Dr. Matthews. How does something like this happen? It happens by being in a different building every day, whenever possible popping comfortably into classrooms, walking the halls with children, participating in class activities, talking to and caring for all those around him, showing genuine interest and excitement to see the world-class teaching and learning which takes place. It comes from having excellent communication skills, weekly Novi news articles, blogs, coffee chats, book clubs, emails, and tweets. Writing newspaper articles which are articulate, useful, and full of life experiences. Um, that res resonates with all of us. It comes from creatively weaving in a lesson to be learned in each article without feeling or be of being lectured capturing the greatness of our district and proudly sharing in his blog, keeping us informed on the educational challenges in our state and celebrating the efforts of his, of his staff. By the way, I don't know this man. I only live in the community. How does one rise to my Dr. Matthews level? It comes from attending countless school-related events and fundraisers. My son Tommy's favorite was Bow tie Thursday, I can see that's still happening today. <laughs> it happens by winning over the love and respect of all those who work with him and for him. Being a relationship builder and a wise teacher. Through motivating, inspiring, and challenging your teachers to greatness during a time when those in the profession may not feel so valued by creating four focused district goals and driving them to success. By the way, I can state those four goals just by reading your newspaper articles. I don't even have to study. <laughs> Dr. Matthews, you have to know, a district with our outstanding success does not happen without greater, great leadership. Your great leadership. How can our district earn an A-plus um, rating? Be number six in the state for best public school districts. Be rated in the top 10 by Family Circle Magazine. Have all of its schools ranked in the state's top 95th percentile. And yet, have a superintendent who is evaluated by the Novi Board of Education as barely effective? It makes absolutely no sense. I have to share, on rare occasions I catch the board meeting broadcasts. I've watched some of the dynamics of the board and I am a little concerned. As you know, we have a new Secretary of Education who is not known for her friendliness to public schools. 
there is a real chance that private and charter schools may come to be favored in some way. We're going to need a highly functioning board and our Dr. Matthews to navigate any possible turbulent waters. My suggestion is that you put any personal issues aside and think of the children and our great district. Dr. Matthews, please know that our no by school community knows you. We see you and hear you. We know the NOVA Board of Education evaluation does not represent you. Right. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is the superintendent's report, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Uh, I would uh, like to remind everyone once again that Friday, uh, February 17th, tomorrow, uh, at Novi Middle School, they will present the play The Music Man, and it will begin at 7.30 p.m. in the Novi Middle School Auditorium. I would also like to highlight the Novi High School One Act Play Team uh, will compete this weekend in the state finals. They've had tremendous success this year, and I wish them good luck in their performance this weekend. Uh, the next superintendent uh, parent to parent book club will be february 27th at 6 30 p.m at the novi public library and we'll be discussing the book brain rules by john mendina and uh, next week is our midwinter break and there will be no school on uh, monday tuesday and wednesday february 20th 21st and 22nd thank you dr matthews anybody have questions or comments about that all right i i appreciate you putting a plug in for the um, one act to play that's exciting for them um, next we have committee reports this is a new item on our agenda that gives the opportunity for anybody that's met in committee um, if they're prepared to share some of their committee minutes um, and mrs glibzinski i see you are prepared uh, no i shared uh, that our minutes were going to be posted and those are posted on board books for all of you i just wanted to let you know that the governance and policy committee is meeting again a uh, week from tonight, February 23rd, from 5 to 7, and that agenda uh, will be posted on board book tomorrow. So if the rest of the board wants to take a look at that, if I've missed something or there's something that you brought to my attention that I have failed to get on the agenda, um, please let me know. But we'll be uh, faithfully plodding along, and you'll have some new policies to look at in March. Okay. Do we have any other committee reports? Okay, um, now is the time for board communication. This is an opportunity for board members to share things that they've been involved in over the last couple of weeks since we've met. This is okay. Stevenson. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, I just want to thank you for coming out on Monday evening. Um, Ms. Murphy and I were at the um, We Rise presentation that was celebrated and commended African American History Month. Um, in collaboration with the Novi Public Library. I want to thank Awkward Pause and the Acapella Group and all the fantastic speakers we had. It was a great night and very successful and looking forward to many more. Other board members? Mrs. Klebzinski? I apologize. I have three or four, five maybe things to share with all of you, but I'm <laughs> going to be brief. Um, first of all, I did attend the One Act play Wiley and the Hairy Man. It was very entertaining and um, I wish them well in the, their competitions. <laughs> very interesting story. Um, last Sunday, or last Saturday, I popped into the high school, which isn't typical for me on a Saturday morning, but the high school was humming with things. Jump for Heart was going on in the field house with all five elementaries coming together to um, do an activity together. And I was skeptical, but they had each school color coded, which was awesome. So you could see the t-shirts from the different schools. And uh, many of our teachers were there on Saturday supporting their students in that activity. And then I understand Meadows followed that up with Hoops for Heart. And uh, I did also run into somebody from Frog Force who insisted as long as I was in the building that I go down to the wing and see <laughs> you know, what was going on with Frog Force and uh, a parent who's uh, jumped in and become involved kind of toured me around the different rooms and explained what was going on and when their competition was coming up. So I wish Frog Force well. Um, and uh, you might notice that I've taken my sweater off. I have a red t-shirt on now that's Advertising Music Man, which has been referred to a couple times. 
But what you may not know is today, Mrs. Murphy and I picked up our scripts. <laughs> not really knowing that I needed to know some songs and some choreography for the night. But um, I encourage you, the students have worked really diligently, and it's a delightful <coughs> musical. And it um, is at the middle school. It starts at 7.30. 7.30. I believe. And there are tickets still available. So um, come on out for now. that. And there was a wonderful article in the Novi News, too, about that today, which is good. And lastly, a number of us attended um, school board school last Friday, as I like to call it. And I want to share uh, about two of the classes that I attended. The first one was called Collaborative Conversations for Effective Decision Making, and Mr. Cook was in that class with me. And the purpose of the class, or the objective, was to understand how to use two-way talking, uh, dialogue and discussion to facilitate effective decision making. They shared seven norms of collaboration, which due to time I'm not going to go through all seven of them. And then um, we worked on building the skills necessary to effectively carry out high quality group deliberation. And I had two takeaways from that class. Um, it was interesting, a number of the boards have one meeting a month that's entirely for discussion and deliberations, um, like our work sessions. And then they have one meeting where they actually take action. And a lot of them, that um, meeting for that deliberation and work session is not in a formal setting uh, videotaped. Um, so just interesting. And then also uh, they pointed out that when you adopt policies that you have two readings before the adoption and I think our practice has been one reading in the adoption. So we should probably check on whether we, we need to be doing that. So that was that class. And then the other class I went to along with Mrs. Murphy was Board Operating Procedures and that really opened my, my uh, thinking to understanding the difference between our policies, bylaws, and operating procedures. And um, I realized that um, there is a big benefit to having procedures recorded so that when there's a transition of officers and transition of people off the board and new members on, that how we function um, is all spelled out so that there can be consistency and a clarification of expectations. And I also realized that uh, ours aren't all that formalized. We have three documents that stand alone that are posted on our website. One's called Additional Operating Procedures, but we actually don't have the document that says Operating Procedures. Um, so the other part of the class was uh, what steps it takes to actually create board operating procedures. And um, I took away from that that it would be beneficial for us to have an operating procedure manual. And um, next week at our governance and policy committee meeting, we're going to take some time to talk about uh, how and where it makes sense to do that and also the steps that the class suggested would take and one of the big takeaways is for that uh, procedure manual to be effective there has to be consensus that that's how we all want to operate so we want to make sure in moving ahead that the things that we document is what our practice is going to be everybody agrees that that's what it should be and then once it's actually established it won't be as cumbersome to maintain um, but then it also has to align with our policies and bylaws so uh, those was probably the best class I've taken of any of my MASB training. So, um, and thank you to my fellow board members. Mrs. Hood was there too, and I understand Mr. Wren has been online doing some classes. So I really appreciate uh, everybody's efforts to get out there and look for best practices so we can uh, work better and more collaboratively with our administration and with each other. Well, Mr. Mena? Speaking of collaborative, um, I decided I'd try something new here. Recently, the uh, um, the board alias was added to the um, district press release distribution list, so thank you uh, for that. But I, I think it would be great if we can get, um, you know, parents and community members, uh, uh, give them the opportunity to receive these as well. Um, and I think these clearly align with our goal number four. So assuming that we have board support, I'd like to see if we can get 
um, a listserv added for those particular documents as well so that folks could um, add that, um, have that option to receive those as well. And I'm just I looking to see if that. we have, you know, support for sort that of could a be mundane. one of our listserv options that people would check. Right, right. And it's sort of a mundane yeah. request, a idea recommendation I thought I'd, I'd bring before us. So, um, you know, I, if, uh, Everyone thinks it's reasonable. I think you've got the yep, head nice and eyes in too. Um, the the other thing that I wanted to mention, Dr. Matthews mentioned this uh, uh, before um, early in the meeting. I had an opportunity to visit the Novi hockey game last night, and uh, Farmington Schools was there with their truck to broadcast the game. It was great to see because there was eight students there um, from Par Farmington who were uh, being given the opportunity to enhance their uh, skill set in this area. And coincidentally. Uh, earlier in the week, I ran into somebody from the city and they continue to tell me that they're still really hoping to partner with the city around this initiative. I'll uh, recall that we made a concerted effort uh, to purchase similar equipment so that we can leverage uh, collective knowledge. Uh, we had a meeting with them early on, but, but I'm not sure we ever continued. It sort, seemed to sort of stop. Um, and I understand they're still waiting to hear back from us uh, to complete the connectivity of the fiber cable between uh, the two entities. Uh, the city has a couple of video uh, technical experts who are willing to come in, who might be willing to come in, uh, and um, video some of our events and give students an opportunity to work with them, uh, especially if we don't currently have the, the time and the manpower. Uh, from my perspective, this would be a win-win for both en entities, uh, but nothing will happen until we really start this uh, serious line of, of communication. Um, so I think this would be a great opportunity for us to leverage the investment that we made as well as give our students another avenue for enhancing their educational opportunity. So um, I'm hoping that maybe we can get some sort of an update uh, shortly on, on what our future plans are surrounding our partnership with the city around that uh, area. I'd like to see that update. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Other board members? Hi, I just want to talk um, a little bit about new board school, or because I'm new here. Uh, and you know, in the past, my perspective has always been from a, as a parent, and I have um, interacted with probably hundreds of parents from other school districts selling ticket or selling tickets at the fanfare or the winter invitational or hot dogs at basketball games and. Um, other parents are always very um, generous with their um, kudos to Novi for our facilities, for the way we run things, and it, it was nice. So now that I've been doing this for a month um, and talking to other board members uh, over in Troy on Friday and Saturday, um, I, I took four classes and one of them was school budget and financing. So I have to say, I did not have any wait what moments because I knew everything that they were talking about because we have Mr. Barr. But the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, is we have lunch with, with folks and they talk about issues and sometimes chaos and things that they have going on in their district. And, um, and we don't have that here. And I, I, am, I am thankful. Um, you know, this has been a long night, but we are surrounded by success. We're surrounded by engaged, smart um, people who spend their days with our kids and love them. And it's, it, I think it speaks well to there's no drama. It speaks well to we have strong, steady, collaborative leadership from Dr. Matthews and his team. So. That's my, my newbie Good. statement. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Cook? Um, as demonstrated tonight, we've got some outstanding teachers. Um, uh, but I'm going to put a plug, another plug in for um, the Above and Beyond Award. And this time I will read a lot of it on the application. Uh, the Above and Beyond Award is a way to recognize the distinguished service of individuals within Novi Community School District, either staff or student who have a special need or support special students with support students with special needs as exemplary. 
This is going to be presented by the Novi Special Education Parent Advisory Committee, a committee of Novi School parents, represent, parent representatives. The awards will be presented in the spring. To be eligible, you could be a student in the special education program that has shown exemplary performance or a student or staff member that has provided distinguished service to one or more special education students throughout the year. Nominations are actually due tomorrow and they are going to choose, they're going to recognize a winner will be selected from each category based solely on the nomination. And any, anybody who is nominated will also be recognized even though they, are, they do not win. Um, like I said, nominations are due by tomorrow, but nominations received after tomorrow will also um, be recognized, but may not be eligible to receive the award. But this is one, another way that uh, our special teachers, our special students, our special parents can be recognized and uh, brings it more to a Novi community school district. Just on that point, I know I saw a listserv went out about it, but is there a place for the um, form that's on the website or is there a place that parents can go to access the form? The, the, the form is on a link for forms in the, on the uh, Special Education Parents Action Committee website. Okay. Um, it is part of the flyer. It's actually on the second page. So. And that's available. And that can be that can be mailed. That can be brought into the student service department here, or it can be emailed to. Uh, there's a subject email on, on the on the web page. And uh, um, it just. Please recognize anybody and everyone. It's, it's, these are kids that need it, and some of them have really uh, stepped up this year. <laughs> so. Great. Thank you. All right, I'll just uh, real briefly, um, because we've had a lot going on, I think, this past week. Um, I actually attended the law firm conference, the Troon Law Firm um, conference with um, Mrs. Holly, and Nicole Carter was there as well. It was a school discipline workshop. Um, there's a lot of recent revisions to the revised school code that are going to require more policy work. Um, <laughs> right. Right. So, um, and a lot of work on our handbooks. Um, so there's a there's a lot involved with it. So they, they covered the new rules on mandatory expulsions, which have changed. Um, additional factors that you have to consider when suspending or expelling students. Uh, significance of a rebuttal presumption in discipline hearings, you resume restorative justice practices, which are now going to be mandatory, which we're kind of ahead of the curve there because we've been doing some of that already at the middle school, so I was excited to see that. Uh, bullying and cyberbullying, they had an update on that, and then also due process and student discipline hearings. So they had a lot of information, and I think Sheila's going to be adding some of that information to our board book resources. Um, so if there's things that you want to look over there. Now I know, Mr. O'Connor, you provided some great information also in there from your, Clark Hill. From, from the Clark Hill workshop. And I know I looked at that. There's a lot of overlap, but great information um, there. And I would encourage, especially before we do our policy work, if board members could kind of take a look at some of that stuff, it would probably be helpful. Um, I did also um, attend the board president workshop over the weekend and got a nice thick notebook. I won't go into all the details, but a lot of information about um, best practices um, that will hopefully help me in my role here. And then um, the board operating procedures class. I just thought both of them had some real practical suggestions as well as obviously covering a lot of legal ones, which we are responsible for that. And. Um, I think that is about, oh, I did jump at, stop at the Jump Rope for Heart event. I thought for a first time event, they really had it organized very well. And I really appreciated that Mr. Taylor gave a big shout out to the parents for supporting all the additions um, in our district. Um, he talked a lot about the athletic um, additions that we've made to help support our student athletes, thank the parents for those, and also encourage them to then look at the uh, at some of the facilities over there. And I thought, what a great opportunity to get our elementary school parents over there seeing what great things we have once the kids get to high school. So um, I appreciated that he took the time to do that. I thought that was a, it was a nice touch, and there was a very captive audience of parents there to, to kind of do that thank you to. So I, I would just want to give a shout out to him for, for taking that on, organizing it, and really having it run fairly, fairly smoothly. 
um, for a first time effort. I do not believe we have a need for executive session this evening. So, oh, Mr. Cook. Just real quick, you mentioned in the true seminar that you discuss bullying. And part of our policy is for an annual mm -hmm. report out to, from the superintendent. Yep. Could, that, that's that part answer? of that's the uh, um, working with the building principals to bring that to the board this spring. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Mr. Mena. Do I have support? I support. Supported by Mrs. Hood. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Carrie, Seth, we are adjourned for the evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone.